A Short History of England by G. K. Chesterton Narrated by Rainer Borton 1. Introduction It will be very reasonably asked why I should consent, though upon a sort of challenge, to write even a popular essay in English history who make no pretense to particular scholarship and am merely a member of the public. The answer is that I know just enough to know one thing, that a history from the standpoint of a member of the public has not been written. What we call the popular histories should rather be called the anti-popular histories. They are all, nearly without exception, written against the people, and in them the populace is either ignored or elaborately proved to have been wrong. It is true that Green called his book a short history of the English people, but he seems to have thought it too short for the people to be properly mentioned. For instance, he calls one very large part of his story Puritan England. But England never was Puritan. It would have been almost as unfair to call the rise of Henry of Navarre Puritan France. And some of our extreme Whig historians would have been pretty nearly capable of calling the campaign of Wexford and Drogheda Puritan Ireland. But it is especially in the matter of the Middle Ages that the popular histories trample upon the popular traditions. In this respect, there is an almost comic contrast between the general information provided about England in the last two or three centuries in which its present industrial system was being built up and the general information given about the preceding centuries which we all call broadly medieval. Of the sort of waxwork history which is thought sufficient for the sideshow of the age of abbots and crusaders, a small instance will be sufficient. A popular encyclopedia appeared some years ago professing, among other things, to teach English history to the masses, and in this I came upon a series of pictures of the English kings. No one could expect them to be all authentic, but the interest attached to those that were necessarily imaginary. There is much vivid material in contemporary literature for portraits of men like Henry II or Edward I, but this did not seem to have been found or even sought. And wandering to the image that stood for Stephen of Blois, my eye was staggered by a gentleman with one of those helmets with steel brims curved like a crescent, which went with the age of ruffs and trunk hose. I am tempted to suspect that the head was that of a halberdia at some such scene as the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. But he had a helmet, and helmets were medieval, and any old helmet was good enough for Stephen. Now, suppose the readers of that work of reference had looked for the portrait of Charles I and found the head of a policeman. Suppose it had been taken modern helmet and all, out of some snapshot in the daily sketch of the arrest of Mrs. Pankhurst. I think we may go so far as to say that the readers would have refused to accept it as a lifelike portrait of Charles I. They would have formed the opinion that there must be some mistake. Yet the time that elapsed between Stephen and Mary was much longer than the time that has elapsed between Charles and ourselves. The revolution in human society between the first of the Crusades and the last of the Tudors was immeasurably more colossal and complete than any change between Charles and ourselves. And, above all, that revolution should be the first thing and the final thing in anything calling itself a popular history for it is the story of how our populace gained great things, but today has lost everything. Now, I will modestly maintain that I know more about English history than this 
and that I have as much right to make a popular summary of it as the gentleman who made the Crusader and the Halberdier change hats. But the curious and arresting thing about the neglect, one might say the omission, of medieval civilization in such histories as this, lies in the fact I have already noted. It is exactly the popular story that is left out of the popular history. For instance, even a working man, a carpenter or cooper or bricklayer, has been taught about the Great Charter as something like the Great Orc, save that its almost monstrous solitude came from being before its time instead of after. He was not taught that the whole stuff of the Middle Ages was stiff with the parchment of charters, that society was once a system of charters, and of a kind much more interesting to him. The carpenter heard of one charter given to barons, and chiefly in the interest of barons. The carpenter did not hear of any of the charters given to carpenters, to coopers, to all the people like himself. Or... To take another instance, the boy and girl reading the stock simplified histories of the schools practically never heard of such a thing as a burger until he appears in a shirt with a noose round his neck. They certainly do not imagine anything of what he meant in the Middle Ages. And Victorian shopkeepers did not conceive themselves as taking part in any such romance as the adventures of Courtru where the medieval shopkeepers more than won their spurs, for they won the spurs of their enemies. I have a very simple motive and excuse for telling the little I know of this true tale. I have met in my wanderings a man brought up in the lower quarters of a great house, fed mainly on its leavings and burdened mostly with its labours. I know that his complaints are stilled, and his status justified by a story that is told to him. It is about how his grandfather was a chimpanzee and his father a wild man of the woods, caught by hunters and tamed into something like intelligence. In the light of this, he may well be thankful for the almost human life that he enjoys, and may be content with the hope of leaving behind him a yet more evolved animal. Strangely enough, the calling of this story by the sacred name of progress ceased to satisfy me when I began to suspect, and to discover, that it is not true. I know by now enough at least of his origin to know that he was not evolved, but simply disinherited. His family tree is not a monkey tree, save in the sense that no monkey could have climbed it, Rather, it is like that tree torn up by the roots and named Dedis Chado on the shield of the unknown knight. Two. The Province of Britain. The land on which we live once had the highly poetic privilege of being the end of the world. Its extremity was Ultima Thule the other end of nowhere. When these islands, lost in a night of northern seas, were lit up at last by the long searchlights of Rome, it was felt that the remotest remnant of things had been touched, and more for pride than possession. The sentiment was not unsuitable, even in geography. About these realms upon the edge of everything, there was really something that can only be called edgy. Britain is not so much an island as an archipelago. It is at least a labyrinth of peninsulas. In few of the kindred countries can one so easily and so strangely find sea in the fields or fields in the sea. The great rivers seem not only to meet in the ocean, but barely to miss each other in the hills. The whole land, though low as a whole, leans towards the west in shouldering mountains, and a prehistoric tradition has taught it to look towards the sunset for islands yet dreamier than its own. 
The islanders are of a kind with their islands, different as are the nations into which they are now divided, the Scots, the English, the Irish, the Welsh of the western uplands, have something altogether different from the humdrub docility of the inland Germans or from the Bonsens Francie, which can be at will trenchant or trite. There is something common to all the Britons, which even acts of union have not torn asunder. The nearest name for it is insecurity, something fitting in men walking on cliffs and the verge of things. Adventure, a lonely taste in liberty, a humour without wit, perplex their critics and perplex themselves. Their souls are fretted like their coasts. They have an embarrassment, noted by all foreigners. It is expressed, perhaps, in the Irish by a confusion of speech and in the English by a confusion of thought. For the Irish bull is a licence with the symbol of language. But bull's own bull, the English bull, is a dumb ox of thought, a standing mystification in the mind. There is something double in the thoughts as of the soul mirrored in many waters. Of all peoples, they are least attached to the purely classical, the imperial plainness which the French do finely and the Germans coarsely, but the Britons hardly at all. They are constantly colonists and emigrants. They have the name of being at home in every country, but they are in exile in their own country. They are torn between love of home and love of something else, of which the sea may be the explanation or may be only the symbol. It is also found in a nameless nursery rhyme, which is the finest line in English literature and the dumb refrain of all English poems. Over the hills and far away. The great rationalist hero who first conquered Britain whether or no he was the detached demigod of Caesar and Cleopatra, was certainly a Latin of the Latins, and described these islands when he found them with all the curt positivism of his pen of steel. But even Julius Caesar's brief account of the Britons leaves on us something of this mystery, which is more than ignorance of fact. They were apparently ruled by that terrible thing, a pagan priesthood. Stones, now shapeless yet arranged in symbolic shapes, bear witness to the order and labour of those that lifted them. Their worship was probably nature worship, and while such a basis may count for something in the elemental quality that has always soaked the island arts, the collision between it and the tolerant empire suggests the presence of something which generally grows out of nature worship. I mean, the unnatural. But upon nearly all the matters of modern controversy, Caesar is silent. He is silent about whether the language was Celtic, and some of the place names have even given rise to a suggestion that, in parts at least, it was already Teutonic. I am not capable of pronouncing upon the truth of such speculations, but I am of pronouncing upon their importance at least to my own very simple purpose. And indeed their importance has been very much exaggerated. Caesar professed to give no more than the glimpse of a traveller, but when, some considerable time after, the Romans returned and turned Britain into a Roman province, they continued to display a singular indifference to questions that have excited so many professors. What they cared about was getting and giving in Britain what they had got and given in Gaul. We do not know whether the Britons then, or for that matter the Britons now, were Iberian or Cumric or Teutonic. We do know that in a short time they were Roman. Every now and then there is discovered in modern England some fragment such as a Roman pavement, such Roman antiquities rather diminish than increase the Roman reality. They make something seem distant which is still very near, 
and something seem dead that is still alive. It is like writing a man's epitaph on his front door. The epitaph would probably be a compliment, but hardly a personal introduction. The important thing about France and England is not that they have Roman remains. They are Roman remains. In truth, they are not so much remains as relics, for they are still working miracles. A row of poplars is a more Roman relic than a row of pillars. Nearly all that we call the works of nature have but grown like fungoids upon the original work of man, and our woods are mosses on the bones of a giant. Under the seed of our harvests and the roots of our trees is a foundation of which the fragments of tile and brick are but emblems, and under the colours of our wildest flowers are the colours of a Roman pavement. Britain was directly Roman for fully four hundred years, longer than she has been Protestant, and very much longer than she has been industrial. What was meant by being Roman, it is necessary in a few lines to say, or no sense can be made of what happened after, especially of what happened immediately after. Being Roman did not mean being subject, in the sense that one savage tribe will enslave another, or in the sense that the cynical politicians of recent times watched with a horrible hopefulness for the evanescence of the Irish. Both conquerors and conquered were heathen, and both had the institutions which seem to us to give an inhumanity to heathenism. The triumph, the slave market, the lack of all the sensitive nationalism of modern history. But the Roman Empire did not destroy nations. If anything, it created them. Britons were not originally proud of being Britons, but they were proud of being Romans. The Roman steel was at least as much a magnet as a sword. In truth, it was rather a round mirror of steel in which every people came to see itself. For Rome as Rome, the very smallness of the civic origin was a warrant for the largeness of the civic experiment. Rome itself obviously could not rule the world any more than Rutland. I mean, it could not rule the other races as the Spartans ruled the Hellas or the Americans ruled the Negroes. A machine so huge had to be human. It had to have a handle that fitted any man's hand. The Roman Empire necessarily became less Roman as it became more of an empire, until not very long after Rome gave conquerors to Britain, Britain was giving emperors to Rome. Out of Britain, as the Britons boasted, came at length the great empress Helena, who was the mother of Constantine. And it was Constantine, as all men know, who first nailed up that proclamation which all after generations have in truth been struggling either to protect or to tear down. About that revolution no man has ever been able to be impartial. The present writer will make no idle pretense of being so. That it was the most revolutionary of all revolutions, since it identified the dead body on a servile gibbet with the fatherhood in the skies, has long been a commonplace without ceasing to be a paradox. But there is another historic element that must also be realised. Without saying anything more of its tremendous essence, it is very necessary to note why even pre-Christian Rome was regarded as something mystical for long afterwards by all European men. The extreme view of it was held, perhaps, by Dante, but it pervaded medievalism and therefore still haunts modernity. Rome was regarded as man, mighty though fallen, because it was the utmost that man had done. It was divinely necessary that the Roman Empire should succeed, if only that it might fail. Hence, the school of Dante implied the paradox that the Roman soldiers killed Christ, not only by right, but even by divine right.
that mere law might fail at its highest test, it had to be real law and not mere military lawlessness. Therefore, God worked by Pilate as by Peter. Therefore, the medieval poet is eager to show that Roman government was simply good government and not a usurpation. For it was the whole point of the Christian revolution to maintain that in this good government was as bad as bad. Even good government was not good enough to know God among the thieves. This is not only generally important as involving a colossus change in the conscience, the loss of the whole heathen repose in the complete sufficiency of the city or the state. It made a sort of eternal rule, enclosing an eternal rebellion. It must be incessantly remembered through the first half of English history, for it is the whole meaning in the quarrel of the priests and kings. The double rule of the civilization and the religion, in one sense, remained for centuries, and before its first misfortunes came, it must be conceived as substantially the same everywhere and however it began, it largely ended in equality. Slavery certainly existed, as it had in the most democratic states of ancient times. Harsh officialism certainly existed, as it exists in the most democratic states of modern times. But there was nothing of what we mean in modern times by aristocracy, still less of what we mean by racial domination, insofar as any change was passing over that society with its two levels of equal citizens and equal slaves, it was only the slow growth of the power of the church at the expense of the power of the empire. Now, it is important to grasp that the great exception to equality, the institution of slavery, was slowly modified by both causes. It was weakened both by the weakening of the empire and by the strengthening of the church. Slavery was for the church not a difficulty of doctrine, but a strain on the imagination. Aristotle and the pagan sages who had defined the servile or useful arts had regarded the slave as a tool, an axe to cut wood or whatever wanted cutting. The church did not denounce the cutting, but she felt as if she was cutting glass with a diamond. She was haunted by the memory that the diamond is so much more precious than the glass. So Christianity could not settle down into the pagan simplicity that the man was made for the work when the work was so much less immortally momentous than the man. At about this stage of a history of England, there is generally told the anecdote of a pun of Gregory the Great, and this is perhaps the true point of it. By the Roman theory, the barbarian bondmen were meant to be useful. The saint's mysticism was moved at finding them ornamental and nang angli sed angeli, meant more nearly not slaves but souls. It is to the point, in passing, to note that in the modern country most collectively Christian, Russia, the serfs were always referred to as souls. The great Pope's phrase, hackneyed as it is, is perhaps the first glimpse of the golden halos in the best Christian art. Thus the Church, with whatever other faults, worked of her own nature towards greater social equality, and it is a historical error to suppose that the Church hierarchy worked with aristocracies or was of a kind with them. It was an inversion of aristocracy, In the ideal of it, at least, the last were to be first. The Irish bull that one man is as good as another and a great deal better contains a truth, like many contradictions, a truth that was the link between Christianity and citizenship. Alone of all superiors, the saint does not depress the human dignity of others, He is not conscious of his superiority to them, but only more conscious of his inferiority than they are. But while a million little priests and monks, like mice, were already nibbling at the bonds of the ancient servitude, another process was going on, which has here been called the weakening of the empire. 
It is a process which is, to this day, very difficult to explain. But it affected all the institutions of all the provinces, especially the institution of slavery. But of all the provinces, its effect was heaviest in Britain, which lay on or beyond the borders. The case of Britain, however, cannot possibly be considered alone. The first half of English history has been made quite unmeaning in the schools by the attempt to tell it without reference to that corporate Christendom in which it took part and pride. I fully accept the truth in Mr. Kipling's question of what can they know of England who only England know, and merely differ from the view that they will best broaden their minds by the study of Wagga Wagga and Timbuktu. It is therefore necessary, though very difficult, to frame in a few words some idea of what happened to the whole European race. Rome itself, which had made all that strong world, was the weakest thing in it. The centre had been growing fainter and fainter, and now the centre disappeared. Rome had as much freed the world as ruled it, and now she could rule no more save for the presence of the Pope and his constantly increasing supernatural prestige, the Eternal City became like one of her own provincial towns. A loose localism was the result rather than any conscious intellectual mutiny. There was anarchy, but there was no rebellion. For rebellion must have a principle, and therefore, for those who can think, an authority. Gibbon called his great pageant of prose the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The empire did decline, but it did not fall. It remains to this hour. By a process very much more indirect even than that of the church, this decentralization and drift also worked against the slave state of antiquity. The localism did indeed produce that choice of territorial chieftains which came to be called feudalism, and of which we shall speak later. But the direct possession of man by man, the same localism tended to destroy. Though this negative influence upon it bears no kind of proportion to the positive influence of the Catholic Church. The later pagan slavery, like our own industrial labour which increasingly resembles it, was worked on a larger and larger scale, and it was at last too large to control. The bondman found the visible lord more distant than the new invisible one. The slave became the serf, that is, he could be shut in, but not shut out. When once he belonged to the land, it could not be long before the land belonged to him. Even in the old and rather fictitious language of chattel slavery, there is here a difference. It is the difference between a man being a chair and a man being a house. Canute might call for his throne, but if he wanted his throne room, he must go and get it himself. Similarly, he could tell his slave to run, but he could only tell his serf to stay. Thus, the two slow changes of the time both tended to transform the tool into a man. His status began to have roots, and whatever has roots will have rights. What the decline did involve everywhere was decivilization, the loss of letters, of laws, of roads and means of communication, the exaggeration of local colour into caprice. But on the edges of the empire, this decivilization became a definite barbarism, owing to the nearness of the wild neighbors who were ready to destroy as deftly and blindly as things are destroyed by fire. Save for the lurid and apocalyptic locust flight of the Huns, it is perhaps an exaggeration to talk, even in those darkest ages, of a deluge of the barbarians at least when we are speaking of the old civilization as a whole. But a deluge of barbarians is not entirely an exaggeration of what happened on some of the borders of the empire, of such edges of the known world as we began by describing in these pages. And on the extreme edge of the world lay Britain. It may be true that, 
though there is little proof of it, that the Roman civilization itself was thinner in Britain than in the other provinces. But it was a very civilized civilization. It gathered round the great cities like York and Chester and London, for the cities are older than the counties, and indeed older even than the countries. These were connected by a skeleton of great roads, which were and are the bones of Britain. But with the weakening of Rome, the bones began to break under barbarian pressure, coming at first from the north, from the Picts who lay beyond Acrigola's boundary in what is now the Scotch lowlands. The whole of this bewildering time is full of temporary tribal alliances, generally mercenary, of barbarians paid to come on or barbarians paid to go away. It seems certain that in this welter Roman Britain bought help from ruder races living about that neck of Denmark where is now the Duchy of Schleswig. Having been chosen only to fight somebody, they naturally fought anybody, and a century of fighting followed, under the trampling of which the Roman pavement was broken into yet smaller pieces. It is perhaps permissible to disagree with the historian Green when he says that no spot should be more sacred to modern Englishmen than the neighbourhood of Ramsgate, where the Schwarzwick people are supposed to have landed, or when he suggests that their appearance is the real beginning of our island story. It would be rather more true to say that it was nearly, though prematurely, the end of it. Three. The Age of Legends We should be startled if we were quietly reading a prosaic modern novel and somewhere in the middle it turned without warning into a fairy tale. We should be surprised if one of the spinsters in Cranford, after tidily sweeping the room with a broom, were to fly away on a broomstick. Our attention would be arrested if one of Jane Austen's young ladies, who had just met a dragoon, were to walk a little further and meet a dragon. Yet something very like this extraordinary transition takes place in British history at the end of the purely Roman period. We have to do with rational and almost mechanical accounts of encampment and engineering, of a busy bureaucracy and occasional frontier wars, quite modern in their efficiency and inefficiency. And then, all of a sudden, we are reading of wandering bells and wizard lances, of wars against men as tall as trees or as short as toadstools. The soldier of civilization is no longer fighting with goths, but with goblins. The land becomes a labyrinth of furay towns unknown to history, and scholars can suggest but cannot explain how a Roman ruler or a Welsh chieftain towers up in the twilight as the awful and unbegotten Arthur. The scientific age comes first and the mythological age after it. One working example, the echoes of which lingered till very late in English literature, may serve to sum up the contrast. The British state, which was found by Caesar, was long believed to have been founded by Brutus. The contrast between the one very dry discovery and the other very fantastic foundation has something decidedly comic about it, as if Caesar's Et tu, Brute, might be translated, What? You? Here? But in one respect, the fable is quite as important as the fact. They both testify to the reality of the Roman foundation of our insular society, and show that even the stories that seem prehistoric are seldom pre-Roman. When England is Elfland, the elves are not the angels. All the phrases that can be used as clues through the tangle of traditions are more or less Latin phrases, and in all our speech there was no word more Roman than romance. The Roman legions left Britain in the 4th century, this did not mean that the Roman civilization left it, but it did mean that the civilization lay far more open both to admixture and attack. Christianity had almost certainly come to Britain, not indeed otherwise than by the routes established by Rome, 
but certainly long before the official Roman mission of Gregory the Great. It had certainly been largely swamped by later heathen invasions of the undefended coasts. It may, then, rationally be urged that the hold both of the empire and its new religion were here weaker than elsewhere, and that the description of the general civilization in the last chapter is proportionately irrelevant. This, however, is not the chief truth of the matter. There is one fundamental fact which must be understood of the whole of this period, yet a modern man must very nearly turn his mind upside down to understand it. Almost every modern man has in his head an association between freedom and the future. The whole culture of our time has been full of the notion of a good time coming. Now the whole culture of the Dark Ages was full of the notion of a good time going. They looked backwards to old enlightenment and forwards to new prejudices. In our time there has come a quarrel between faith and hope, which perhaps must be healed by charity. But they were situated otherwise. They hoped, but it may be said that they hoped for yesterday. All the motives that make a man a progressive now made a man a conservative then. The more he could keep of the past, the more he had of a fair law and a free state. The more he gave way to the future, the more he must endure of ignorance and privilege. All we call reason was one with all we call reaction. And this is the clue which we must carry with us through the lives of all the great men of the Dark Ages, of Alfred, of Bidet, of Dunstan, If the most extreme modern Republican were put back in that period, he would be an equally extreme Papist or even Imperialist. For the Pope was what was left of the Empire, and the Empire was what was left of the Republic. We may compare the man of that time, therefore, to one who has left free cities and even free fields behind him, and is forced to advance towards a forest. And the forest is the fittest metaphor, not only because it was really that wild European growth, cloven here and there by the Roman roads, but also because there has always been associated with forests another idea which increased as the Roman order decayed. The idea of the forests was the idea of enchantment. There was a notion of things being double or different from themselves, of beasts behaving like men, and not merely, as modern wits would say, of men behaving like beasts. But it is precisely here that it is most necessary to remember that an age of reason had preceded the age of magic. The central pillar which has sustained the storied house of our imagination ever since has been the idea of the civilized knight amid the savage enchantments the adventures of a man still sane in a world gone mad. The next thing to note in the matter is this, that in this barbaric time none of the heroes are barbaric. They are only heroes if they are anti-barbaric. Men, real or mythical, or more probably both, became omnipresent like gods among the people, and force themselves into the faintest memory and the shortest record, exactly in proportion as they had mastered the heathen madness of the time and preserved the Christian rationality that had come from Rome. Arthur has his name because he killed the heathen. The heathen who killed him have no names at all. Englishmen, who know nothing of English history, but less than nothing of Irish history, have heard somehow or other of Brian Baru, though they spell it Boru, and seem to be under the impression that it is a joke. It is a joke, the subtlety of which they would never have been able to enjoy if King Brian had not broken the heathen in Ireland at the great battle of Clontarf. The ordinary English reader would never have heard of Olaf of Norway if he had not preached the gospel with his sword, or of the Cid if he had not fought against the Crescent, and though Alfred the Great seems to have deserved his title even as a personality, 
he was not so great as the work he had to do. But the paradox remains that Arthur is more real than Alfred, for the age is the age of legends. Towards these legends, most men adopt by instinct a sane attitude, and of the two, credulity is certainly much more sane than incredulity. It does not much matter whether most of the stories are true, and, as in such cases as Bacon and Shakespeare, to realise that the question does not matter is the first step towards answering it correctly. But before the reader dismisses anything like an attempt to tell the earlier history of the country by its legends, he will do well to keep two principles in mind both of them tending to correct the crude and very thoughtless scepticism which has made this part of the story so sterile. The 19th century historians went on the curious principle of dismissing all people of whom tales are told and concentrating upon people of whom nothing is told. Thus, Arthur is made utterly impersonal because all legends are lies, But somebody of the type of Hengist is made quite an important personality, merely because nobody thought him important enough to lie about. Now, this is to reserve all common sense. A great many witty sayings are attributed to Talleron, which were really said by somebody else, but they would not be so attributed if Talleron had been a fool, still less if he had been a fable, That fictitious stories are told about a person is, nine times out of ten, extremely good evidence that there was somebody to tell them about. Indeed, some allow that marvellous things were done, and that there may have been a man named Arthur at the time in which they were done. But here, so far as I am concerned, the distinction becomes rather dim. I do not understand the attitude which holds that there was an ark and a man named Noah, but cannot believe in the existence of Noah's ark. The other fact to be remembered is that scientific research for the last few years has worked steadily in the direction of confirming and not dissipating the legends of the populace. To take only the obvious instance, modern excavators with modern spades have found a solid stone labyrinth in Crete, like that associated with Minotaur, which was conceived as being as cloudy a fable as the Chimera. To most people this would have seemed quite as fantastic as finding the roots of Jack's beanstalk or the skeletons in Bluebeard's cupboard, yet it is simply the fact. Finally, A truth is to be remembered which scarcely ever is remembered in estimating the past. It is the paradox that the past is always present. Yet it is not what was, but whatever seems to have been, for all the past is a part of faith. What did they believe of their fathers? In this matter, new discoveries are useless because they are new. We may find men wrong in what they thought they were, but we cannot find them wrong in what they thought they thought. It is therefore very practical to put in a few words, if possible, something of what a man of these islands in the Dark Ages would have said about his ancestors and his inheritance. I will attempt here to put some of the simpler things in their order of importance as he would have seen them, and if we are to understand our fathers who first made this country anything like itself, it is most important that we should remember that if this was not their real past, it was their real memory. After that blessed crime, as the wit of the mystics called it, which was for these men hardly second to the creation of the world, St. Joseph of Arithmathea, one of the few followers of the new religion who seemed to have been wealthy, set sail as a missionary, and, after long voyages, came to that litter of little islands which seemed to the men of the Mediterranean something like the last clouds of the sunset. He came up upon the western and wilder side of that wild and western land, and made his way to a valley which, through all the oldest records, is called Avalon. Something of rich rains and warmth in its westland meadows, or something in some lost pagan traditions about it, made it persistently regarded as a kind of earthly paradise. 
Arthur, after being slain at Lioness, is carried here as if to heaven. Here the pilgrim planted his staff in the soil, and it took root as a tree that blossoms on Christmas Day. A mystical materialism marked Christianity from its birth. The very soul of it was a body. Among the stoical philosophies and oriental negations that were its first foes, it fought fiercely, and particularly for a supernatural freedom to cure concrete maladies by concrete substances. Hence, the scattering of relics was everywhere, like the scattering of seed. All who took their mission from the divine tragedy bore tangible fragments which became the germs of churches and cities. St. Joseph carried the cup which held the wine of the Last Supper and the blood of the crucifixion to that shrine in Avalon which we now call Glastonbury, and it became the heart of a whole universe of legends and romances, not only for Britain but for Europe. Throughout this tremendous and branching tradition it is called the Holy Grail. The vision of it was especially the reward of that ring of powerful paladins whom King Arthur feasted at a round table, a symbol of heroic comradeship such as was afterwards imitated or invented by medieval knighthood. Both the cup and the table are of vast importance emblematically in the psychology of the chivalric experiment. The idea of a round table is not merely universality, but equality. It has in it, modified of course, by other tendencies to differentiation, the same idea that exists in the very word peers as given to the knights of Charlemagne. In this, the round table is as Roman as the round arch, which might also serve as a type for instead of being one barbaric rock merely rolled on the others, the king was rather the keystone of an arch. But to this tradition of a level of dignity was added something unearthly that was from Rome, but not of it. The privilege that inverted all privileges, the glimpse of heaven which seemed almost as capricious as fairyland the flying chalice which was veiled from the highest of all the heroes and which appeared to one knight who was hardly more than a child. Rightly or wrongly, this romance established Britain for after centuries as a country with a chivalrous past. Britain had been a mirror of universal knighthood. This fact, or fancy, is of colossal import in all ensuing affairs, especially the affairs of barbarians. These and numberless other local legends are indeed for us buried by the forests of popular fancies that have grown out of them. It is all the harder for the serious modern mind because our fathers felt at home with these tales and therefore took liberties with them. Probably the rhyme which runs, When good King Arthur ruled this land, he was a noble king, he stole three pecks of barley meal, is much nearer the true medieval note than the aristocratic stateliness of Tennyson. But about all these grotesques of the popular fancy, there is one last thing to be remembered. It must especially be remembered by those who would dwell exclusively on documents and take no note of tradition at all. Wild as would be the results of credulity concerning all the old wives' tales, it would not be so wild as the errors that can arise from trusting to written evidence when there is not enough of it. Now, the whole written evidence for the first parts of our history would go into a small book. A very few details are mentioned and none are explained. A fact thus standing alone, without the key of contemporary thought, may be very much more misleading than any fable. To know what word an archaic scribe wrote without being sure of what thing he meant may produce a result that is literally mad. Thus, for instance, it would be unwise to accept literally the tale that St. Helena was not only a native of Colchester, but was a daughter of old King Cole. 
but it would not be very unwise, not so unwise as some things that are deduced from documents. The natives of Colchester certainly did honour to St. Helena and might have had a king named Cole. According to the more serious story, the saint's father was an innkeeper and the only recorded action of Cole is well within the resources of that calling. It would not be nearly so unwise as to deduce from the written word, as some critic of the future may do, that the natives of Colchester were oysters. Four. The Defeat of the Barbarians It is a quaint accident that we employ the word short-sighted as a condemnation, but not the word long-sighted, which we should probably use, if at all, as a compliment. Yet the one is as much a malady of vision as the other. We rightly say, in rebuke of a small-minded modernity, that it is very short-sighted to be indifferent to all that is historic. But it is as disastrously long-sighted to be interested only in what is prehistoric. And this disaster has befallen a large proportion of the learned who grope in the darkness of unrecorded epochs for the roots of their favourite race or races. The wars, the enslavements, the primitive marriage customs, the colossal migrations and massacres upon which their theories repose, are no part of history or even of legend and rather than trust with entire simplicity to these, it would be infinitely wiser to trust to legend of the loosest and most local sort. In any case, it is as well to record even so simple a conclusion as that what is prehistoric is unhistorical. But there is another way in which common sense can be brought to the criticism of some prodigious racial theories. To employ the same figure, Suppose the scientific historians explain the historic centuries in terms of prehistoric division between short-sighted and long-sighted men. They could cite their instances and illustrations. They would certainly explain the curiosity of language I mentioned first, as showing that the short-sighted were the conquered race and their name therefore a term of contempt. They could give us very graphic pictures of the rude tribal war. They could show how the long-sighted people were always cut to pieces in hand-to-hand -hand struggles with axe and knife, until, with the invention of bows and arrows, the advantage veered to the long-sighted and their enemies were shot down in droves. I could easily write a ruthless romance about it, and still more easily a ruthless anthropological theory. According to that thesis which refers all mortal to material changes, they could explain the tradition that old people grow conservative in politics by the well-known fact that old people grow more long-sighted. But I think there might be one thing about this theory which would stump us, and might even, if it be possible, stump them. Suppose it were pointed out that, through all the three thousand years of recorded history, abounding in literature of every conceivable kind, there was not so much as a mention of the occultist question for which all had been dared and done. Suppose not one of the living or dead languages of mankind had so much as a word for long-sighted or short-sighted. Suppose, in short, the question that had torn the whole world in two was never even asked at all, until some spectacle-maker suggested it somewhere about 1750. In that case, I think we should find it hard to believe that this physical difference had really played so fundamental a part in human history, and that it is exactly the case with the physical difference between the Celts, the Teutons, and the Latins. I know of no way in which fair-haired people can be prevented from falling in love with dark-haired people and I do not believe that whether a man was long-headed or round-headed ever made much difference to anyone who felt inclined to break his head. To all mortal appearance, in all mortal records and experience, people seem to have killed or spared, married or refrained from marriage, made kings or made slaves.' 
with reference to almost any other consideration except this one. There was the love of a valley or a village, a site or a family. There were enthusiasms for a prince and his hereditary office. There were passions rooted in locality, special emotions about sea folk or mountain folk. There were historic memories of a cause or an alliance. There was, more than all, the tremendous test of religion. But of a cause like that of the Celts or Teutons, covering half the earth, there was little or nothing. Race was not only never at any given moment a motive, but it was never even an excuse. The Teutons never had a creed, they never had a cause, and it was only a few years ago that they began even to have a cant. The orthodox modern historian, notably Green, remarks on the singularity of Britain in being alone of all Roman provinces wholly cleared and re-peopled by a Germanic race. He does not entertain, as an escape from the singularity of this event, the possibility that it never happened. In the same spirit, he deals with the little that can be quoted of the Teutonic society. His ideal picture of it is completed in small touches which even an amateur can detect as dubious. Thus, he will touch on the Teuton with the phrase like, the basis of their society was the free man, and on the Roman with a phrase like, the mines, if worked by forced labour, must have been a source of endless oppression. The simple fact being that the Roman and the Teuton both had slaves. He treats the Teuton freeman as the only thing to be considered, not only then, but now, and then goes out of his way to say that if the Roman treated his slaves badly, the slaves were badly treated. He expresses a strange disappointment that Gildas, the only British chronicler, does not describe the great Teutonic system. In the opinion of Gildas, a modification of that of Gregory, it was a case of Nan Angli said Diaboli. The modern Teutonist is disappointed that the contemporary authority saw nothing in his Teutons except wolves, dogs, and whelps from the kennel of barbarism. But it is at least faintly tenable that there was nothing else to be seen. In any case, when St. Augustine came to the largely barbarized land with what may be called the second of the three great southern visitations which civilized these islands, he did not see any ethnological problems, whatever there may have been to be seen. With him, or his converts, the chain of literary testimony is taken up again, and we must look at the world as they saw it. He found a king ruling in Kent, beyond whose borders lay other kingdoms of about the same size, the kings of which were all apparently heathen. The names of these kings were mostly what we call Teutonic names, but those who write the almost entirely hagiological records did not say, and apparently did not ask, whether the populations were in this sense of unmixed blood. It is at least possible that, as on the continent, the kings and courts were almost the only Teutonic element. The Christians found converts, they found patrons, they found persecutors, but they did not find ancient Britons because they did not look for them, and if they moved among pure Anglo-Saxons, they had not the gratification of knowing it. There was, indeed, what all history attests, a marked change of feeling towards the marches of Wales. But all history also attests that this is always found, apart from any difference in race, in the transition from the lowlands to the mountain country. But of all the things they found, the thing that counts most in English history is this, that some of the kingdoms at least did correspond to genuine human divisions, which not only existed then, but which exist now. Northumbria is still a truer thing than Northumberland. Sussex is still Sussex, Essex is still Essex. And that third Saxon kingdom, whose name is not even to be found upon the map, the Kingdom of Wessex, is called the West Country, 
and is today the most real of them all. The last of the heathen kingdoms to accept the cross was Mercia, which corresponds very roughly to what we call the Midlands. The unbaptized king, Penda, has even achieved a certain picturesqueness through his fact and through the forays and furious ambitions which constituted the rest of his reputation. So much so that the other day one of those mystics who will believe anything but Christianity proposed to continue the work of Penda in Ealing, fortunately not on any large scale. What that prince believed or disbelieved is now impossible and perhaps unnecessary to discover, but this last stand of his central kingdom is not insignificant. The isolation of the Mercian was perhaps due to the fact that Christianity grew from the eastern and western coasts. The eastern growth was, of course, the Augustinian mission, which had already made Canterbury the spiritual capital of the island. The western grew from whatever was left of the British Christianity. The two clashed, not in creed, but in customs, and the Augustinians ultimately prevailed. But the work from the west had already been enormous, It is possible that some prestige went with the possession of Glastonbury, which was like a piece of the Holy Land, but behind Glastonbury there was an even grander and more impressive power. There irradiated to all Europe at that time the glory of the Golden Age of Ireland. There the Celts were the classics of Christian art, opened in the Book of Kells, 400 years before its time. There, the baptism of the whole people had been a spontaneous popular festival which reads almost like a picnic, and thence came crowds of enthusiasts for the gospel almost literally like men running with good news. This must be remembered through the development of that dark, dual destiny that has bound us to Ireland, for doubts have been thrown on a national unity which was not from the first a political unity. But if Ireland was not one kingdom, it was in reality one bishopric. Ireland was not converted, but created by Christianity, as a stone church is created, and all its elements were gathered as under a garment, under the genius of St. Patrick. It was the more individual because the religion was mere religion, without the secular conveniences. Ireland was never Roman, and it was always Romanist. But indeed this is, in a lesser degree, true of our more immediate subject. It is the paradox of this time that only the unworldly things had any worldly success. The politics are a nightmare, the kings are unstable, and the kingdoms shifting, and we are really never on solid ground except on consecrated ground. The material ambitions are not only always unfruitful, but nearly always unfulfilled. The castles are all castles in the air. It is only the churches that are built on the ground. The visionaries are the only practical men, as in that extraordinary thing, the monastery, which was in many ways to be the key of our history. The time was to come when it was to be rooted out of our country with a curious and careful violence, and the modern English reader has therefore a very feeble idea of it and hence of the ages in which it worked. Even in these pages, a word or two about its primary nature is therefore quite indispensable. In the tremendous testament of our religion, There are present certain ideals that seem wilder than impieties, which have in later times produced wild sects professing an almost inhuman perfection on certain points, as in the Quakers, who renounce the right of self-defence, or the Communists, who refuse any personal possessions. Rightly or wrongly, the Christian Church had from the first dealt with these visions as being special spiritual adventures which were to the adventurous. She reconciled them with natural human life by calling them specially good, without admitting that the neglect of them was necessarily bad. 
She took the view that it takes all sorts to make a world, even the religious world, and used the man who chose to go without arms, family or property as a sort of exception that proved the rule. Now, the interesting fact is that he really did prove it. This madman who would not mind his own business becomes the businessman of the age. The very word monk is a revolution, for it means solitude and came to mean community. One might call it sociability. What happened was that this communal life became a sort of reserve and refuge behind the individual life, a hospital for every kind of hospitality. We shall see later how this same function of the common life was given to the common land. It is hard to find an image for it in individualist times, but in private life we most of us know the friend of the family who helps it by being outside, like a fairy godmother. It is not merely flippant to say that monks and nuns stood to mankind as a sort of sanctified league of aunts and uncles. It is a commonplace that they did everything that nobody else would do, that the abbeys kept the world's diary, faced the plagues of all flesh, taught the first technical arts, preserved the pagan literature, and, above all, by a perpetual patchwork of charity, kept the poor from the most distant sight of their modern despair. We still find it necessary to have a reserve of philanthropists, but we trust it to men who have made themselves rich, not to men who have made themselves poor. Finally, the abbots and abbesses were elective. They introduced representative government, unknown to ancient democracy, and in itself a semi-sacramental idea. If we could look from the outside at our own institutions, we should see that the very notion of turning a thousand men into one large man walking to Westminster is not only an act or faith, but a fairy tale. The fruitful and effective history of Anglo-Saxon England would be almost entirely a history of its monasteries. Mile by mile and almost man by man, they taught and enriched the land. And then, about the beginning of the ninth century, there came a turn, as of the twinkling of an eye, and it seemed that all their work was in vain. The outer world of universal anarchy that lay beyond Christendom heaved another of its colossal and almost cosmic waves and swept everything away. Through all the eastern gates, left open, as it were, by the first barbarian auxiliaries, burst a plague of seafaring savages from Denmark and Scandinavia, and the recently baptised barbarians were again flooded by the unbaptised. All this time, it must be remembered, the actual central mechanism of Roman government had been running down like a clock. It was really a race between the driving energy of the missionaries on the edges of the empire and the galloping paralysis of the city at the centre. In the ninth century, the heart had stopped before the hands could bring help to it. All the monastic civilization which had grown up in Britain under a vague Roman protection perished unprotected. The toy kingdoms of the quarrelling Saxons were smashed like sticks. Guthrum, the private chief, slew St. Edmund, assumed the crown of East England, took tribute from the Panic of Mercia, and towered in menace over Wessex, the last of the Christian lands. The story that follows page after page, is only the story of its despair and its destruction. The story is a string of Christian defeats alternated with victories so vain as to be more desolate than defeats. It is only in one of these, the fine but fruitless victory at Ashdown, that we first see in the dim struggle, in a desperate and secondary part, the figure who has given his title to the ultimate turning of the tide for the victor was not then the king, but only the king's younger brother. There is, from the first, something humble and even accidental about Alfred. He was a great understudy. 
The interest of his early life lies in this, that he combined an almost commonplace coolness and readiness for the ceaseless small bargains and shifting combinations of all that period with the flaming patience of saints in times of persecution. While he would dare anything for the faith, he would bargain in anything except the faith. He was a conqueror, with no ambition, an author only too glad to be a translator, a simple, concentrated, wary man watching the fortunes of one thing, which he piloted both bodily and cautiously, and which he saved at last. He had disappeared after what appeared to be the final heathen triumph and settlement, and is supposed to have lurked like an outlaw in a lonely islet in the impenetrable marshlands of the parrot, towards those wild western lands to which aboriginal races are held to have been driven by fate itself. But Alfred, as he himself wrote in words that are his challenge to the period, held that a Christian man was unconcerned with fate. He began once more to draw to him the bows and spears of the broken levies of the western shires, especially the men of Somerset, and in the spring of 878 he flung them at the lines before the fenced camp of the victorious Danes at Ethendune. His sudden assault was as successful as that at Ashdown, and it was followed by a siege which was successful in a different and very definite sense. Guthrum, the conqueror of England, and all his important supports were here penned behind their palisades, and when at last they surrendered, the Danish conquest had come to an end. Guthrum was baptised, and the Treaty of Wedmore secured the clearance of Wessex. The modern reader will smile at the baptism and turn with greater interest to the terms of the treaty. In this acute attitude, the modern reader will be vitally and hopelessly wrong. He must support the tedium of frequent references to the religious element in this part of English history, for without it there would never have been any English history at all, and nothing could clinch this truth more than the case of the Danes. In all the facts that followed, the baptism of Guthrum is really much more important than the Treaty of Wedmore. The treaty itself was a compromise, and even as such did not endure. A century afterwards a Danish king like Canute was really ruling in England. But though the Dane got the crown, he did not get rid of the cross. It was precisely Alfred's religious exaction that remained unalterable and Canute himself is actually now only remembered by men as a witness to the futility of merely pagan power, as the king who put his own crown upon the image of Christ and solemnly surrendered to heaven the Scandinavian empire of the sea. Five, St. Edward and the Norman Kings the reader may be surprised at the disproportionate importance given to the name which stands first in the title of this chapter. I put it there as the best way of emphasizing, at the beginning of what we may call the practical part of our history, an elusive and rather strange thing. It can only be described as the strength of the weak kings. It is sometimes valuable to have enough imagination to unlearn as well as to learn. I would ask the reader to forget his reading and everything that he learnt at school and consider the English monarchy as it would then appear to him. Let him suppose that his acquaintance with the ancient kings has only come to him as it came to most men in simpler times, from nursery tales, from the names of places, from the dedications of churches and charities, from the tales in the tavern and the tombs in the churchyard. Let us suppose such a person going upon some open and ordinary English way, such as the Thames Valley to Windsor, or visiting some old seats of culture, such as Oxford or Cambridge. One of the first things, for instance, he would find would be Eton, 
a place transformed indeed by modern aristocracy, but still enjoying its medieval wealth and remembering its medieval origin. If he asked about that origin, it is probable that even a public schoolboy would know enough history to tell him that it was founded by Henry VI. If he went to Cambridge and looked with his own eyes for the college chapel, which artistically towers above all others like a cathedral, he would probably ask about it and be told it was King's College. If he asked which king, he would again be told Henry VI. If he then went into the library and looked up Henry VI in an encyclopedia, he would find that the legendary giant who had left these gigantic works behind him was in history an almost invisible pygmy. Amid the varying and contending numbers of a great national quarrel, he is the only cipher. The contending factions carry him about like a bale of goods. His desires do not seem to be even ascertained, far less satisfied, and yet his real desires are satisfied in stone and marble, in oak and gold, and remain through all the maddest revolutions of modern England, while all the ambitions of those who dictated to him have gone away like dust upon the wind. Edward the Confessor, like Henry VI, was not only an invalid, but almost an idiot. It is said that he was wan, like an albino, and that the awe men had of him was partly that which is felt for a monster of mental deficiency. His Christian charity was the kind that borders on anarchism, and the stories about him recall the Christian fools in the great anarchic novels of Russia. Thus, he is reported to have covered the retreat of a common thief upon the naked plea that the thief needed things more than he did. Such a story is in strange contrast to the claims made for other kings that theft was impossible in their dominions. Yet the two types of king are afterwards praised by the same people, and the really arresting fact is that the incompetent king is praised the more highly of the two and exactly as in the case of the last Lancastrian, we find that the praise was really a very practical meaning in the long run. When we turn from the destructive to the constructive side of the Middle Ages, we find that the village idiot is the inspiration of cities and civic systems. We find his seal upon the sacred foundations of Westminster Abbey, we find the Norman visitors in the hour of victory bowing before his very ghost. In the tapestry of Baillieu, woven by Norman hands to justify the Norman cause and glorify the Norman triumph, nothing is claimed for the conqueror beyond his conquest and the plain personal tale that excuses it, and the story abruptly ends with the breaking of the Saxon line at battle. But over the buyer of the decrepit Zany, who died without striking a blow, over this and this alone, is shown a hand coming out of heaven and declaring the true approval of the power that rules the world. The confessor, therefore, is a paradox in many ways and in none more than in the false reputation of the English of that day. As I have indicated, there is some unreality in talking about the Anglo-Saxon at all, The Anglo-Saxon is a mythical and straddling giant who has presumably left one footprint in England and the other in Saxony. But there was a community, or rather group of communities, living in Britain before the conquest under what we call Saxon names, and of a blood probably more Germanic and certainly less French than the same communities after the conquest. And they have a modern reputation, which is exactly the reverse of their real one. The value of the Anglo-Saxon is exaggerated, and yet his virtues are ignored. Our Anglo-Saxon blood is supposed to be the practical part of us, but as a fact, the Anglo-Saxons were more hopelessly unpractical than any Celt. Their racial influence is supposed to be healthy, or what many think the same thing, heathen. But as a fact, these Teutons were the mystics. The Anglo-Saxons did one thing, and one thing only, thoroughly well, as they were fitted to do it thoroughly well.
they christened England. Indeed, they christened it before it was born. The one thing the Angles obviously and certainly could not manage to do was to become English. But they did become Christians, and indeed showed a particular disposition to become monks. Moderns, who talk vaguely of them as our hardy ancestors, never do justice to the real good they did us, by thus opening our history, as it were, with the fable of an age of innocence, and beginning all our chronicles, as so many chronicles began, with the golden initial of a saint. By becoming monks, they served us in many very valuable and special capacities. But not notably, perhaps, in the capacity of ancestors. Along the northern coast of France, where the confessor had passed his early life, lay the lands of one of the most powerful of the French king's vassals, the Duke of Normandy. He and his people, who constitute one of the most picturesque and curious elements in European history, are confused for most of us by irrelevant controversies which would have been entirely unintelligible to them. The worst of these is the inane fiction which gives the name of Norman to the English aristocracy during its great period of the last three hundred years. Tennyson informed a lady of the name of Verdiver that simple faith was more valuable than Norman blood but the historical student who can believe in Lady Clara as the possessor of the Norman blood must be himself a large possessor of the simple faith. As a matter of fact, as we shall see also when we come to the political scheme of the Normans, the notion is the negation of their real importance in history. The fashionable fancy misses what was best in the Normans, exactly as we have found it missing in what was best in the Saxons. One does not know whether to thank the Normans more for appearing or for disappearing. Few philanthropists ever became so rapidly anonymous. It is the great glory of the Norman adventurer that he threw himself heartily into his chance position, and had faith not only in his comrades, but in his subjects, and even in his enemies. He was loyal to the kingdom he had not yet made. Thus, the Norman Bruce becomes a Scot. Thus, the descendant of the Norman Strongbow becomes an Irishman. No men less than Normans can be conceived as remaining as a superior caste until the present time. But this alien and adventurous loyalty in the Norman, which appears in these other national histories, appears most strongly of all in the history we have here to follow. The Duke of Normandy does become a real King of England, his claim through the Confessor, his election by the Council, even his symbolic handfuls of the soil of Sussex. These are not altogether empty forms. And though both phrases would be inaccurate, it is very much nearer the truth to call William the first of the English than to call Harold the last of them. An indeterminate debate touching the dim races that mixed without record in that dim epoch has made much of the fact that the Norman edges of France, like the East Anglian edges of England, were deeply penetrated by the Norse invasions of the ninth century, and that the ducal house of Normandy, with what other families we know not, can be traced back to a Scandinavian seed. The unquestionable power of captaincy and creative legislation which belonged to the Normans, whoever they were, may be connected reasonably enough with some infusion of fresh blood. But if the racial theorists press the point to a comparison of races, it can obviously only be answered by a study of the two types in separation. And it must surely be manifest that more civilizing power has since been shown by the French when untouched by Scandinavian blood than by the Scandinavians when untouched by French blood. As much fighting, and more ruling, was done by the Crusaders who were never Vikings as by the Vikings who were never Crusaders. But in truth, there is no need of such invidious analysis we may willingly allow a real value to the Scandinavian contribution to the French as to the English nationality, so long as we firmly understand the ultimate historic fact that the Duchy of Normandy was about as Scandinavian as the town of Norwich.
but the debate has another danger, in that it tends to exaggerate even the personal importance of the Norman. Many, as were his talents as a master, he is in history the servant of other and wider things. The landing of Langfranc is perhaps more of a date than the landing of William, and Langfranc was an Italian, like Julius Caesar. The Norman is not in history a mere wall, the rather brutal boundary of a mere empire. The Norman is a gate. He is like one of those gates which still remain as he made them, with round arch and rude pattern and stout supporting columns and what entered by that gate was civilization. William of Falaise has in history a title much higher than that of Duke of Normandy or King of England. He was what Julius Caesar was, and what St. Augustine was. He was the ambassador of Europe to Britain. William asserted that the confessor, in the course of that connection which followed naturally from his Norman education, had promised the English crown to the holder of the Norman dukedom. Whether he did or not, we shall probably never know. It is not intrinsically impossible or even improbable. To blame the promise as unpatriotic, even if it was given, is to read duties defined at a much later date into the first feudal chaos. To make such blame positive and personal is like expecting the ancient Britons to sing Rule Britannia. William further clinched his case by declaring that Harold, the principal Saxon noble and the most probable Saxon claimant, had, while enjoying the Duke's hospitality after a shipwreck, sworn upon sacred relics not to dispute the Duke's claim. About this episode also we must agree that we do not know, yet we shall be quite out of touch with the time if we say that we do not care. The element of sacrilege in the alleged perjury of Harold probably affected the Pope when he blessed the banner for William's army, but it did not affect the Pope much more than it would have affected the people, and Harold's people quite as much as William's. Harold's people presumably denied the fact, and their denial is probably the motive of the very marked and almost eager emphasis with which the Bayeux tapestry asserts and reasserts the reality of the personal betrayal. There is here a rather arresting fact to be noted. A great part of this celebrated pictorial record is not concerned at all with the well-known historical events which we have only to note rapidly here. It does, indeed, dwell a little on the death of Edward, it depicts the difficulties of William's enterprises in the feeling of forests for shipbuilding, in the crossing of the Channel, and especially in the charge up the hill at Hastings, in which full justice is done to the destructive resistance of Harold's army. But it was really after Duke William had disembarked and defeated Harold on the Sussex coast that he did what is historically worthy to be called the conquest. It is not until these later operations that we have the note of the new and scientific militarism from the continent. Instead of marching upon London, he marched round it, and crossing the Thames at Wallingford, cut off the city from the rest of the country and compelled its surrender. He had himself elected king with all the forms that would have accompanied a peaceful succession to the confessor, and after a brief return to Normandy took up the work of war again to bring all England under his crown. Marching through the snow, he laid waste the northern counties, seized Chester, and made rather than won a kingdom. These things are the foundations of historical England, but of these things the pictures woven in honour of his house tell us nothing. The Bayou tapestry may almost be said to stop before the Norman conquest, but it tells in great detail the tale of some trivial raid into Brittany, solely that Harold and William may appear as brothers in arms, and especially that William may be depicted in the very act of giving arms to Harold. And here again, there is much more significance than a modern reader may fancy. In its bearing upon the new birth of that time and the ancient symbolism of arms. <laughs>
I have said that Duke William was a vassal of the King of France, and that phrase in its use and abuse is the key to the secular side of this epoch. William was indeed a most mutinous vassal, and a vein of such mutiny runs through his family fortunes. His sons, Rufus and Henry I, disturbed him with internal ambitions, antagonistic to his own, but it would be a blunder to allow such personal broils to obscure the system which had indeed existed here before the conquest, which clarified and confirmed it. The system we call feudalism. That feudalism was the main mark of the Middle Ages is a commonplace of fashionable information, but it is of the sort that seeks the past rather in Wardour Street than Watling Street. For that matter, the very term medieval is used for almost anything from early English to early Victorian. An eminent socialist applied it to our armaments, which is like applying it to our aeroplanes. Similarly, the just description of feudalism and of how far it was a part and how far rather an impediment in the main medieval movement is confused by current debates about quite modern things, especially that modern thing, the English squirearchy. Feudalism was very nearly the opposite of squirearchy, for it is the whole point of the squire that his ownership is absolute and is pacific, and it is the very definition of feudalism that it was a tenure, and a tenure by military service. Men paid their rent in steel instead of gold, in spears and arrows against the enemies of their landlord. But even these landlords were not landlords in the modern sense. Every one was practically as well as theoretically a tenant of the king, and even he often fell into a feudal inferiority to a pope or an emperor. To call it mere tenure by soldiering may seem a simplification, but indeed it is precisely here that it was not so simple as it seems. It is precisely a certain knot or enigma in the nature of feudalism which makes half the struggle of European history, but especially English history. There was a certain unique type of state and culture which we call medieval, for want of a better word, which we see in the Gothic or the Great Schoolmen. This thing in itself was above all things logical. Its very cult of authority was a thing of reason, as all men who can reason themselves instantly recognize, even if, like Huxley, they deny its premise or dislike its fruits. Being logical, it was very exact about who had the authority. Now, feudalism was not quite logical, and was never quite exact about who had the authority. Feudalism already flourished before the medieval renaissance began. It was, if not the forest, the medievals had to clear at least the rude timber with which they had to build. Feudalism was a fighting growth of the Dark Ages before the Middle Ages, the age of barbarism resisted by semi-barbarians. I do not say this in disparagement of it. Feudalism was mostly a very human thing, the nearest contemporary name for it was homage, a word which almost means humanity. On the other hand, medieval logic, never quite reconciled to it, could become in its extremes inhuman. It was often mere prejudice that protected men and pure reason that burned them. The feudal units grew through the lively localism of the Dark Ages, when hills without roads shut in a valley like a garrison. Patronism had to be parochial, for men had no country, but only a countryside. In such cases the lord grew larger than the king, but it bred not only a local lordship, but a kind of local liberty, and it would be very inadvisable to ignore the freer element in feudalism in English history, for it is the one kind of freedom that the English have had and held. The knot in the system was something like this. In theory, the king owned everything, like an earthly providence, and that made for despotism and divine right, which meant in substance a natural authority. 
In one aspect, the king was simply the one lord anointed by the church that is recognized by the ethics of the age. But while there was more royalty in theory, there could be more rebellion in practice. Fighting was much more equal than in our age of munitions, and the various groups could arm almost instantly with bows from the forest or spears from the smith. Where men are military, there is no militarism. But it is more vital that while the kingdom was, in this sense, one territorial army, the regiments of it were also kingdoms. The subunits were also sub-loyalties, hence the loyalist to his lord might be a rebel to his king, or the king be a demagogue delivering him from the lord. This tangle is responsible for the tragic passions about betrayal, as in the case of William and Harold. The alleged traitor who is always found to be recurrent, yet always felt to be exceptional. To break the tie was at once easy and terrible. Treason in the sense of rebellion was then really felt as treason in the sense of treachery, since it was desertion on a perpetual battlefield. Now, there was even more of this civil war in English than in other history, and the more local and less logical energy on the whole prevailed. Whether there was something in those island idiosyncrasies, shapeless as sea mists, with which this story began, or whether the Roman imprint had really been lighter than in Gaul, the feudal undergrowth prevented even a full attempt to build the Chivitas Dei, or ideal medieval state. What emerged was a compromise, which men long afterwards amused themselves by calling a constitution. There are paradoxes permissible for the redressing of a bad balance in criticism, and which may safely be emphasized so long as they are not isolated. One of these I have called at the beginning of this chapter the strength of the weak kings, and there is a complement of it, even in this crisis of the Norman mastery, which might well be called the weakness of the strong kings. William of Normandy succeeded immediately. He did not quite succeed ultimately. There was in his huge success a secret of failure that only bore fruit long after his death. It was certainly his single aim to simplify England into a popular autocracy, like that growing up in France. With that aim, he scattered the feudal holdings in scraps demanded a direct vow from the sub-vassals to himself, and used any tool against the barony, from the highest culture of the foreign ecclesiastics to the rudest relics of Saxon custom. But the very parallel of France makes the paradox startlingly apparent. It is a proverb that the first French kings were puppets, that the mayor of the palace was quite incidentally the king of the king, Yet it is certain that the puppet became an idol, a popular idol of unparalleled power before which all mayors and nobles bent or were broken. In France arose absolute government, the more because it was not precisely personal government. The king was already a thing, like the republic. Indeed, the medieval republics were rigid with divine right. In Norman England, perhaps, the government was too personal to be absolute. Anyhow, there is a real, though recondite, sense in which William the Conqueror was William the Conquered. When his two sons were dead, the whole country fell into a feudal chaos almost like that before the conquest. In France, the princes who had been slaves became something exceptional like priests, and one of them became a saint, but somehow our greatest kings were still barons, and by that very energy our barons became our kings. Six. The Age of the Crusades The last chapter began, in an apparent irrelevance, with the name of St. Edward and this one might very well begin with the name of St. George. His first appearance, it is said, as a patron of our people, occurred at the instance of Richard Coeur de Leon, during his campaign in Palestine. And this, as we shall see, 
really stands for a New England which might well have a new saint. But the Confessor is a character in English history, whereas St. George, apart from his place in martyrology as a Roman soldier, can hardly be said to be a character in any history. And if we wish to understand the noblest and most neglected of human revolutions, we can hardly get closer to it than by considering this paradox, of how much progress and enlightenment was represented by thus passing from a chronicle to a romance. In any intellectual corner of modernity can be found such a phrase as I have just read in a newspaper controversy. Salvation, like other good things, must not come from outside. To call a spiritual thing external and not internal is the chief mode of modernist excommunication. But if our subject of study is medieval and not modern, we must pit against this apparent platitude the very opposite idea. We must put ourselves in the posture of men who thought that almost every good thing came from outside, like good news. I confess that I am not impartial in my sympathies here, and that the newspaper phrase I quoted strikes me as a blunder about the very nature of life. I do not, in my private capacity, believe that a baby gets his best physical food by sucking his thumb, nor that a man gets his best moral food by sucking his soul, and denying its dependence on God or other good things. I would maintain that thanks are the highest form of thought, and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. But this faith in receptiveness and in respect for things outside oneself need here to do more than help me in explaining what any version of this epoch ought in any case to explain. In nothing is the modern German more modern, or more mad, than in his dream of finding a German name for everything, eating his language, or in other words, biting his tongue, and in nothing were the medievals more free and sane than in their acceptance of names and emblems from outside their most beloved limits. The monastery would often not only take in the stranger, but almost canonize him. A mere adventurer like Bruce was enthroned and thanked as if he had really come as a knight-errant, and a passionately patriotic community more often than not had a foreigner for a patron saint. Thus, crowds of saints were Irishmen, but St. Patrick was not an Irishman. Thus, as the English gradually became a nation, they left the numberless Saxon saints, in a sense, behind them, passed over by comparison not only the sanctity of Edward, but the solid fame of Alfred, and invoked a half-mythical hero, striving in an eastern desert against an impossible monster. That transition and that symbol stand for the Crusades. In their romance and reality, they were the first English experience of learning, not only from the external, but the remote. England, like every Christian thing, had driven on outer things without shame. From the roads of Caesar to the churches of Lanfranc, it had sought its meat from God. But now the eagles were on the wing, Scenting a more distant slaughter, they were seeking the strange things instead of receiving them. The English had stepped from acceptance to adventure, and the epic of their ships had begun. The scope of the great religious movement which swept England along with all the West would distend a book like this into huge disproportion. Yet it would be much better to do so than to dismiss it in the distant and frigid fashion common in such short summaries. The inadequacy of our insular method in popular history is perfectly shown in the treatment of Richard Coeur de Lion. His tale is told with the implication that his departure for the crusade was something like the escape of a schoolboy running away to sea. It was, in this view, a pardonable or lovable prank, whereas in truth it was more like a responsible Englishman now going to the front. Christendom was nearly one nation, 
and the front was the Holy Land. That Richard himself was of an adventurous and even romantic temper is true, though it is not unreasonably romantic for a born soldier to do the work he does best. But the point of the argument against insular history is particularly illustrated here by the absence of a continental comparison. In this case, we have only to step across the Straits of Dover to find the fallacy. Philip Augustus, Richard's contemporary in France, had the name of a particularly cautious and coldly public-spirited statesman. Yet Philip Augustus went on the same crusade. The reason was, of course, that the crusades were, for all thoughtful Europeans, things of the highest statesmanship and the purest public spirit. Some six hundred years after Christianity sprang up in the east and swept westwards, another great faith arose in almost the same eastern lands and followed it like its gigantic shadow. Like a shadow, it was at once a copy and a contrary. We call it Islam, or the creed of the Muslims, and perhaps its most explanatory description is that it was the final flaming up of the accumulated Orientalisms, perhaps of the accumulated Hebraisms, gradually rejected as the Church grew more European, or as Christianity turned into Christendom. Its highest motive was a hatred of idols, and in its view, incarnation was itself an idolatry. The two things it persecuted were the idea of God being made flesh and of his being afterwards made wood or stone. A study of the questions smouldering in the track of the prairie fire of the Christian conversion favours the suggestion that this fanaticism against art or mythology was at once a development and a reaction from that conversion a sort of minority report on the Hebraicists. In this sense, Islam was something like a Christian heresy. The early heresies had been full of mad reversals and evasions of the Incarnation, rescuing their Jesus from the reality of his body, even at the expense of the sincerity of his soul. And the Greek iconoclasts had poured into Italy breaking the popular statues and denouncing the idolatry of the Pope until routed in a style sufficiently symbolic by the sword of the father of Charlemagne. It was all these disappointed negations that took fire from the genius of Mohammed and launched out of the burning lands a cavalry charge that nearly conquered the world. And if it be suggested that a note on such Oriental origins is rather remote from a history of England, the answer is that this book may, alas, contain many digressions. But that this is not a digression. It is quite peculiarly necessary to keep in mind that this Semite god haunted Christianity like a ghost. To remember it in every European corner but especially in our corner. If anyone doubts the necessity, let him take a walk to all the parish churches in England within a radius of 30 miles and ask why this stone virgin is headless or that coloured glass is gone. He will soon learn that it was lately and in his own lanes and homesteads that the ecstasy of the deserts returned and his bleak northern island was filled with the fury of the iconoclasts. It was an element in this sublime and yet sinister simplicity of Islam that it knew no boundaries. Its very home was homeless, for it was born in a sandy waste among nomads, and it went everywhere because it came from nowhere. But in the Saracens of the early Middle Ages, the nomadic quality in Islam was masked by a high civilization, more scientific if less creatively artistic than that of contemporary Christendom. The Muslim monotheism was, or appeared to be, the more rationalist religion of the two. This rootless refinement was characteristically advanced in abstract things, of which a memory remains in the very name of algebra. In comparison, the Christian civilization was still largely instinctive, 
but its instincts were very strong and very much the other way. It was full of local affections, which found form in that system of fences, which runs like a pattern through everything medieval, from heraldry to the holding of land. There was a shape and colour in all their customs and statues, which can be seen in all their tabards and escutions, something at once strict and gay. This is not a departure from the interest in external things, but rather a part of it. The very welcome they would often give to a stranger from beyond the wall was a recognition of the wall. Those who think their own life all-sufficient do not see its limits as a wall, but as the end of the world. The Chinese called the white man a skybreaker. The medieval spirit loved its part in life as a part, not a whole. Its character for it came from something else. There is a joke about a Benedictine monk who used the common grace of Benedictus Benedicat, whereupon the unlettered Franciscan triumphantly retorted, Franciscus Franciscat. It is something of a parable of medieval history, for if there were a verb, Franciscari, it would be an approximate description of what St. Francis afterwards did. But that more individual mysticism was only approaching its birth, and Benedictus Benedictat is very precisely the motto of the earliest medievalism. I mean that everything is blessed from beyond, by something which has in its turn been blessed from beyond again. Only the blessed bless. But the point which is the clue to the Crusades is this that for them the beyond was not the infinite, as in a modern religion. Every beyond was a place. The mystery of locality, with all its hold on the human heart, was as much present in the most ethereal things of Christendom as it was absent from the most practical things of Islam. England would derive a thing from France, France from Italy, Italy from Greece, Greece from Palestine, Palestine from Paradise. It was not merely that a yeoman of Kent would have his house hallowed by the priest of the parish church, which was confirmed by Canterbury, which was confirmed by Rome. Rome herself did not worship herself as in the pagan age. Rome herself looked eastward to the mysterious cradle of her creed, to a land of which the very earth was called holy and when she looked eastward for it, she saw the face of Mohammed. She saw standing in the place that was her earthly heaven, a devouring giant out of the deserts, to whom all places were the same. It has been necessary thus to pause upon the inner emotions of the crusade, because the modern English reader is widely cut off from these particular feelings of his father's and the real quarrel of Christendom and Islam. The fire baptism of the young nations could not otherwise be seized in its unique character. It was nothing so simple as a quarrel between two men who both wanted Jerusalem. It was the much deadlier quarrel between one man who wanted it and another man who did not see why it was wanted. The Muslim, of course, had his own holy places, but he has never felt about them as Westerners can feel about a field or a roof tree. He thought of the holiness as holy, not of the places as places. The austerity which forbade him imagery, the wandering war that forbade him rest, shut him off from all that was breaking out and blossoming in our local patriotisms just as it had given the Turks an empire without ever giving them a nation. Now, the effect of this adventure against a mighty and mysterious enemy was simply enormous in the transformation of England, as of all the nations that were developing side by side with England. Firstly, we learnt enormously from what the Saracen did. Secondly, we learnt yet more enormously from what the Saracen did not do. Touching some of the good things which we lacked, we were fortunately able to follow him. But in all the good things which he lacked, 
we were confirmed like adamant to defy him. It may be said that Christians never knew how right they were till they went to war with Muslims. At once, the most obvious and the most representative reaction was the reaction which produced the best of what we call Christian art, and especially those grotesques of Gothic architecture, which are not only alive, but kicking. The East, as an environment, as an impersonal glamour, certainly stimulated the Western mind, but stimulated it rather to break the Muslim commandment than to keep it. It was as if the Christian were impelled, like a caricaturist, to cover all that faceless ornament with faces, to give heads to all those headless serpents and birds to all these lifeless trees. Statutory quickened and came to life under the veto of the enemy as under a benediction. The image, merely because it was called an idol, became not only an ensign, but a weapon. A hundredfold host of stones sprang up all over the shrines and streets of Europe. The place of Cur de Lion, in popular fable and gossip, is far more like his place in true history than the place of the mere denationalized ne'er-do-well given him in our utilitarian schoolbooks. Indeed, the vulgar rumour is nearly always much nearer the historical truth than the educated opinion of today. For tradition is truer than fashion. King Richard, as the typical crusader, did make a momentous difference to England by gaining glory in the East, instead of devoting himself conscientiously to domestic politics in the exemplary manner of King John. The accident of his military genius and prestige gave England something which it kept for four hundred years, and without which it is incomprehensible throughout that period the reputation of being in the very vanguard of chivalry. The great romances of the Round Table, the attachment of knighthood to the name of a British king, belong to this period. Richard was not only a knight, but a troubadour, and culture and courtesy were linked up with the idea of English valour. The medieval Englishman was even proud of being polite, which is at least no worse than being proud of money and bad manners, which is what many Englishmen in our later centuries have meant by their common sense. Chivalry might be called the baptism of feudalism. It was an attempt to bring the justice and even the logic of the Catholic creed into a military system which already existed, to turn its discipline into an initiation and its inequalities into hierarchy. To the comparative grace of the new period belongs, of course, that considerable cultus of the dignity of women, to which the word chivalry is often narrowed, or perhaps exalted. This also was a revolt against one of the worst gaps in the more polished civilization of the Saracens. Muslims denied even souls to women, perhaps from the same instinct which recoiled from the sacred birth, with its inevitable glorification of the mother, perhaps merely because, having originally had tents rather than houses, they had slaves rather than housewives. It is false to say that the chivalric view of women was merely an affectation, except in the sense in which there must always be an affectation where there is an ideal. It is the worst sort of superficiality not to see the pressure of a general sentiment merely because it is always broken up by events. The crusade itself, for example, is more present and potent as a dream even than as a reality. From the first Plantagenet to the last Lancastrian, it haunts the minds of English kings, giving as a background to their battles a mirage of Palestine. So a devotion like that of Edward I to his queen was quite a real motive in the lives of multitudes of his contemporaries. When crowds of enlightened tourists setting forth to sneer at the superstitions of the continent are taking tickets and labelling luggage at the large railway station at the west end of the Strand, 
I do not know whether they all speak to their wives with a more flowing courtesy than their fathers in Edward's time, or whether they pause to meditate on the legend of a husband's sorrow to be found in the very name of Charing Cross. But it is a huge historical error to suppose that the Crusades concerned only that crust of society for which heraldry was an art and chivalry an etiquette. The direct contrary is the fact. The First Crusade especially was much more a unanimous popular rising than most that are called riots and revolutions. The guilds, the great democratic systems of the time, often owed their increasing power to corporate fighting for the cross. But I shall deal with such things later. Often it was not so much a levy of men as a trek of whole families, like new gypsies moving eastwards. And it has passed into a proverb that children by themselves often organized a crusade as they now organize a charade. But we shall best realize the fact by fancying every crusade as a children's crusade. They were full of all that modern world worships in children because it has crushed it out of men. Their lives were full as the rudest remains of their vulgarest arts are full, of something that we all saw out of the nursery window. It can be best seen later, for instance, in the lanced and latticed interiors of Membling but it is ubiquitous in the older and more unconscious contemporary art, something that domesticated distant lands and made the horizon at home. They fitted into the corners of small houses, the ends of the earth and the edges of the sky. Their perspective is rude and crazy, but it is perspective. It is not the decorative flatness of Orientalism. In a word, their world, like a child's, is full of foreshortening, as of a shortcut to fairyland. Their maps are more provocative than pictures. Their half-fabulous animals are monsters, and yet are pets. It is impossible to state verbally this very vivid atmosphere, but it was an atmosphere as well as an adventure. It was precisely these outlandish visions that truly came home to everybody. It was the royal councils and feudal quarrels that were comparatively remote. The Holy Land was much nearer to a plain man's house than Westminster, and immeasurably nearer than Runnymede. To give a list of English kings and parliaments without pausing for a moment upon this prodigious presence of a religious transfiguration in common life is something the folly of which can but faintly be conveyed by a more modern parallel with secularity and religion reversed. It is as if some clericalist or royalist writer should give a list of the archbishops of Paris from 1750 to 1850, noting how one died of smallpox, another of old age, another by a curious accident of decapitation, and throughout all his record should never once mention the nature or even the name of the French Revolution. Seven, the problem of the Plantagenets. It is a point of prestige with what is called the higher criticism in all branches to proclaim that certain popular texts and authorities are late and therefore apparently worthless. Two similar events are always the same event, and the later one alone is even credible. This fanaticism is often, in mere fact, mistaken. It ignores the most common coincidences of human life, and some future critic will probably say that the tale of the Tower of Babel cannot be older than the Eiffel Tower, because there was certainly a confusion of tongues at the Paris Exhibition. Most of the medieval remains familiar to the modern reader are necessarily late, such as Chaucer or the Robin Hood ballads, but they are nonetheless to a wiser criticism worthy of attention and even trust. That which lingers after an epoch is generally that which lived most luxuriantly in it. It is an excellent habit to read history backwards, 
It is far wiser for a modern man to read the Middle Ages backwards from Shakespeare, whom he can judge for himself, and who yet is crammed with the Middle Ages, than to attempt to read them forwards from Cadman of whom he can know nothing, and of whom even the authorities he must trust to know very little. If this be true of Shakespeare, it is even truer, of course, of Chaucer. If we really want to know what was strongest in the twelfth century, it is no bad way to ask what remained of it in the fourteenth. When the average reader turns to the Canterbury Tales, which are still as amusing as Dickings, Yet, as medieval as Durham Cathedral, what is the very first question to be asked? Why, for instance, are they called Canterbury Tales? And what were the pilgrims doing on the road to Canterbury? They were, of course, taking part in a popular festival, like a modern public holiday, though much more genial and leisurely. Nor are we, perhaps, prepared to accept it as a self-evident step in progress that their holidays were derived from saints, while ours are dictated by bankers. It is almost necessary to say nowadays that a saint means a very good man. The notion of an eminence merely moral, consistent with complete stupidity or unsuccess, is a revolutionary image grown unfamiliar by its very familiarity, and needing, as do so many things of this older society, some almost preposterous modern parallel to give its original freshness and point. If we entered a foreign town and found a pillar like the Nelson Column, we should be surprised to learn that the hero on the top of it had been famous for his politeness and hilarity during a chronic toothache. If a procession came down the street with a brass band and a hero on a white horse, we should think it odd to be told that he had been very patient with a half-witted maiden aunt. Yet some such pantomime impossibility is the only measure of the innovation of the Christian idea of a popular and reorganized saint. It must especially be recognized that while this kind of glory was the highest, it was also in a sense the lowest. The materials of it were almost the same as those of labour and domesticity. It did not need the sword or sceptre, but rather the staff or spade. It was the ambition of poverty. All this must be approximately visualised before we catch a glimpse of the great effects of the story which lay behind the Canterbury pilgrimage. The first few lines of Chaucer's poem, to say nothing of thousands in the course of it, make it instantly plain that it was no case of secular revels still linked by a slight ritual to the name of some forgotten god, as may have happened in the pagan decline. Chaucer and his friends did think about St. Thomas at least more frequently than a clerk at Margate thinks about St. Lubbock. They did definitely believe in the bodily cures wrought for them through St. Thomas, at least as firmly as the most enlightened and progressive modern can believe in those of Mrs. Eddy. Who was St. Thomas, to whose shrine the whole of that society is thus seen in the act of moving? And why was he so important? If there be a streak of sincerity in the claim to teach social and democratic history, instead of a string of kings and battles, this is the obvious and open gate by which to approach the figure which disputed England with the first Plantagenet. A real popular history should think more of his popularity even than his policy, and unquestionably thousands of ploughmen, carpenters, cooks and yeomen, as in the motley crowd of Chaucer, knew a great deal about St. Thomas when they had never even heard of Becket. It would be easy to detail what followed the conquest as the feudal tangle that it was, till a prince from Anjou repeated the unifying effort of the conqueror. It is found equally easy to write of the Red King's hunting instead of his building, which has lasted longer and which he probably loved much more. It is easy to catalogue the questions he disputed with Anselm, leaving out the question Anselm cared most about, 
and which he asked with explosive simplicity as, Why was God a man? All this is as simple as saying that a king died of eating lampreys, from which, however, there is little to learn nowadays, unless it be that when a modern monarch perishes of gluttony, the newspapers seldom say so. But if we want to know what really happened to England in this dim epoch, I think it can be dimly but truly traced in the story of St. Thomas of Canterbury. Henry of Anjou, who brought fresh French blood into the monarchy, brought also a refreshment of the idea for which the French have always stood, the idea in the Roman law of something impersonal and omnipresent. It is the thing we smile at even in a small French detective story when justice opens a handbag or justice runs after a cab. Henry II really produced this impression of being a police force in person. A contemporary priest compared his restless vigilance to the bird and the fish of Scripture, whose way no man knoweth. Kinghood, however, meant law and not caprice. Its ideal, at least, was a justice cheap and obvious as daylight, an atmosphere which lingers only in popular phrases about the king's English or the king's highway. But though it tended to be egalitarian, it did not, of itself, tend to be humanitarian. In modern France, as in ancient Rome, the other name of justice has sometimes been terror. The Frenchman especially is always a revolutionist and never an anarchist. Now, this effort of kings like Henry II to rebuild on a plan like that of the Roman law was not only, of course, crossed and tangled by countless feudal fancies and feelings in themselves as well as others, it was also conditioned by what was the cornerstone of the whole civilization. It had to happen not only with, but within the church. For a church was to these men rather a world they lived in than a building to which they went. Without the church, the Middle Ages would have had no law. As without the church, the Reformation would have had no Bible. Many priests expounded and embellished the Roman law, and many priests supported Henry II. And yet there was another element in the church stored in its first foundations like dynamite and destined in every age to destroy and renew the world. An idealism akin to impossibilism ran down the ages parallel to all its political compromises. Mononasticism itself was the throwing off of innumerable utopias, without posterity yet with perpetuity. It had, as was proved recurrently after corrupt epochs, a strange secret of getting poor quickly, a mushroom magnificent of destitution. This wind of revolution in the crusading time caught Francis in Assisi and stripped him of the rich garments in the street. The same wind of revolution suddenly smote Thomas Becket, King Henry's brilliant and luxurious chancellor, and drove him on to the unearthly glory and a bloody end. Becket was a type of those historic times in which it is really very practical to be impracticably. The quarrel which tore him from his friend's side cannot be appreciated in the light of those legal and constitutional debates which the misfortunes of the 17th century have made so much of in more recent history. To convict St. Thomas of illegality and clerical intrigue when he set the law of the church against that of the state is about as adequate as to convict St. Francis of bad heraldry when he said he was the brother of the sun and moon. There may have been heralds stupid enough to say so even in that much more logical age, but it is no sufficient way of dealing with visions or with revolutions. St. Thomas of Canterbury was a great visionary and a great revolutionist, but so far as England was concerned, his revolution failed and his vision was not fulfilled. We are, therefore, told in the textbooks little more than that he wrangled with the king about certain regulations. <laughs>
the most crucial being whether criminous clerks should be punished by the state or the church. And this was indeed the chief text of the dispute. But to realise it, we must reiterate what is hardest for modern England to understand. The nature of the Catholic Church, when it was itself a government, and the permanent sense in which it was itself a revolution. It is always the first fact that escapes notice, and the first fact about the Church was that it created a machinery of pardon where the state could only work with the machinery of punishment. It claimed to be a divine detective who helped the criminal to escape by a plea of guilty. It was, therefore, in the very nature of the institution that when it did punish materially, it punished more lightly. If any modern man were put back in the Beckett quarrel, his sympathies would certainly be torn in two. For if the king's scheme was the more rational, the archbishops was the more humane. And despite the horrors that darkened religious disputes long afterwards, this character was certainly in the bulk of the historic character of church government. It is admitted, for instance, that things like eviction or the harsh treatment of tenants was practically unknown wherever the church was landlord. The principle lingered into more evil days in the form by which the church authorities handed over culprits to the secular arm to be killed, even for religious offences. In modern romances this is treated as a mere hypocrisy. But the man who treats every human inconsistency as a hypocrisy is himself a hypocrite about his own inconsistencies. Our world, then, cannot understand St. Thomas any more than St. Francis without accepting very simply a flaming and even fantastic charity by which the great Archbishop undoubtedly stands for the victims of this world where the wheel of fortune grinds the faces of the poor. He may well have been too idealistic. He wished to protect the church as a sort of earthly paradise, of which the rules might seem to him as paternal as those of heaven, but might well seem to the king as capricious as those of fairyland. But if the priest was too idealistic, the king was really too practical. It is intrinsically true to say he was too practical to succeed in practice. There re-enters here, and runs, I think, through all English history, the rather indescribable truth I have suggested about the conqueror, that perhaps he was hardly impersonal enough for pure despot. The real moral of our medieval story is, I think, subtly contrary to Carlyle's vision of a stormy strong man to hammer and weld the state like a smith. Our strong men were too strong for us, and too strong for themselves. They were too strong for their own aim of a just and equal monarchy. The smith broke upon the anvil the sword of state that he was hammering for himself. Whether or no this will serve as a key to the very complicated story of our kings and barons, it is the exact posture of Henry II to his rival. He became lawless out of sheer love of law. He also stood, though in a colder and more remote manner, for the whole people against feudal oppression, and if his policy had succeeded in its purity, it would at least have made impossible the privilege of capitalism of later times. But that bodily restlessness which stamped and spurned the furniture was a symbol of him. It was some such thing that prevented him and his heirs from sitting as quietly on their throne as the heirs of St. Louis. He thrust again and again at the tough intangibility of the priest's utopianism, like a man fighting a ghost. He answered transcendental defiances with baser material persecutions, and at last, on a dark and, I think, decisive day in English history, his word sent four feudal murderers into the cloisters of Canterbury, who went there to destroy a traitor and who created a saint. At the grave of the dead man broke forth what can only be called an epidemic of healing. 
For miracles so narrated, there is the same evidence as for half the facts of history, and anyone denying them must deny them upon a dogma. But something followed which would seem to modern civilization even more monstrous than a miracle. If the reader can imagine Mr. Cecil Rhodes submitting to be horsewhipped by a boar in St. Paul's Cathedral as an apology for some indefensible death incidental to the Jameson raid, he will form but a faint idea of what was meant when Henry II was beaten by monks at the tomb of his vassal and enemy. The modern parallel called up is comic but the truth is that medieval actualities have a violence that does seem comic to our conventions. The Catholics of that age were driven by two dominant thoughts, the all-importance of penitence as an answer to sin and the all-importance of vivid and evident external acts as a proof of penitence. Extravagant humiliation after extravagant pride for them restored the balance of sanity. The point is worth stressing, because without it, moderns make neither head nor tail of the period. Green gravely suggests, for instance, of Henry's ancestor, Folk of Anu, that his tyrannies and frauds were further blackened by low superstition, which led him to be dragged in a halter round a shrine, scourged and screaming for the mercy of God. Medievals would simply have said that such a man might well scream for it, but his scream was the only logical comment he could make. But they would have quite refused to see why the scream should be added to the sins and not subtracted from them. They would have thought it simply muddle-headed to have the same horror at a man for being horribly sinful and for being horribly sorry. But it may be suggested, I think, though with the doubt proper to ignorance that the Angevin ideal of the king's justice lost more by the death of St. Thomas than was instantly apparent in the horror of Christendom, the canonization of the victim and the public penance of the tyrant. These things indeed were in a sense temporary. The king recovered the power to judge clerics and many later kings and justiciars continued the monarchical plan but I would suggest, as a possible clue to puzzling after events, that here and by this murderous stroke the crown lost what should have been the silent and massive support of its whole policy. I mean that it lost the people. It need not be repeated that the case for despotism is democratic. As a rule, its cruelty to the strong is kindness to the weak, An autocrat cannot be judged as a historical character by his relations with other historical characters. His true applause comes not from the few actors on the lighted stage of aristocracy, but from that enormous audience which must always sit in darkness throughout the drama. The king who helps numberless helps nameless men, and when he flings his widest largest, he is a Christian doing good by stealth. This sort of monarchy was certainly a medieval ideal, nor need it necessarily fail as a reality. French kings were never so merciful to the people as when they were merciless to the peers, and it is probably true that a Tsar, who was a great lord to his inmates, was often a little father in innumerable little homes. It is overwhelmingly probable that such a central power, though it might at last have deserved destruction in England as in France, would in England as in France have prevented the few from seizing and holding all the wealth and power to this day. But in England it broke off short, through something of which the slaying of St. Thomas may well have been the supreme example. It was something overstrained and startling and against the instincts of the people. And of what was meant in the Middle Ages by that very powerful and rather peculiar thing, the people, I shall speak in the next chapter. In any case, this conjecture finds support in the ensuing events. It is not merely that, 
Just as the great but personal plan of the Conqueror collapsed, after all, into the chaos of the Stephen transition, so the great but personal plan of the First Plantagenet collapsed into the chaos of the Barons' Wars. When all allowance is made for constitutional fictions and afterthoughts, it does seem likely that here, for the first time, some moral strength deserted the monarchy. The character of Henry's second son, John, for Richard belongs rather to the last chapter, stamped it with something accidental and yet symbolic. It was not that John was a mere black blot on the pure gold of the Plantagenets, The texture was much more mixed and continuous, but he really was a discredited Plantagenet, and as it were, a damaged Plantagenet. It was not that he was much more of a bad man than many opposed to him, but he was the kind of bad man whom bad men and good do combine to oppose in a sense subtler than that of the legal and parliamentary logic-chopping invented long afterwards, he certainly managed to put the crown in the wrong. Nobody suggested that the barons of Stephen's time starved men in dungeons to promote political liberty, or hung them up by the heels as a symbolic request for a free parliament. In the reign of John and his son, it was still the barons, and not in the least the people, who seized the power. But there did begin to appear a case for their seizing it, for contemporaries as well as constitutional historians afterwards. John, in one of his diplomatic doublings, had put England into the papal care, as an estate is put in chancery. And unluckily the Pope, whose counsels had generally been mild and liberal, was then in his death grapple with the Germanic Emperor and wanted every penny he could get to win. His winning was a blessing to Europe, but a curse to England, for he used the island as a mere treasury for this foreign war. In this and other matters the baronial party began to have something like a principle, which is the backbone of a policy. Much conventional history that connects their councils with a thing like our House of Commons is as far-fetched as it would be to say that the Speaker wields a mace like those which the barons brandished in battle. Simon de Montfort was not an enthusiast for the weak theory of the British Constitution, but he was an enthusiast for something. He founded a Parliament in a fit of considerable absence of mind but it was with true presence of mind in the responsible and even religious sense which had made his father so savage a crusader against heretics that he laid about him with his great sword before he fell at Evesham. Magna Carta was not a step towards democracy, but it was a step away from depotism. If we hold that double truth firmly, we have something like a key to the rest of English history a rather loose aristocracy, not only gained but often deserves the name of liberty, and the history of the English can be most briefly summarised by taking the French motto of liberty, equality and fraternity, and noting that the English have sincerely loved the first and lost the other two. In the contemporary complication, much could be urged both for the crown and the new and more national rally of the nobility. But it was a complication, whereas a miracle is a plain matter that any man can understand. The possibilities or impossibilities of St. Thomas Becket were left a riddle for history. The white flame of his audacious theocracy was frustrated, and his work was cut short like a fairy tale left untold. But his memory passed into the care of the common people, and with them he was more active dead than alive. Yes, even more busy. In the next chapter, we shall consider what was meant in the Middle Ages by the common people, and how uncommon we should think it today. And in the last chapter, we have already seen how, in the crusading age, the strangest things grew homely, and men fed on travellers' tales 
when there were no national newspapers. A many-coloured pageant of martyrology on numberless walls and windows had familiarised the most ignorant with alien cruelties in many climes. With a bishop flayed by Danes or a virgin burned by Saracens, with one saint stoned by Jews and another hewn in pieces by Negroes. I cannot think it was a small matter that among these images one of the most magnificent had met his death but lately at the hands of an English monarch. There was at least something akin to the primitive and epical romances of that period in the tale of those two mighty friends, one of whom struck too hard and slew the other. It may even have been so early as this that something was judged in silence, and for the multitude rested on the crown a mysterious seal of insecurity like that of Cain and of exile on the English kings. 8. The Meaning of Merry England the mental trick by which the first half of English history has been wholly dwarfed and dehumanised is a very simple one. It consists in telling only the story of the professional destroyers and then complaining that the whole story is one of destruction. A king is at the best a sort of crowned executioner. All government is an ugly necessity and if it was then uglier, it was for the most part merely because it was more difficult. What we call the judges' circuits were first rather the king's raids. For a time, the criminal class was so strong that ordinary civil government was conducted by a sort of civil war. When the social enemy was caught at all, he was killed or savagely maimed. The king could not take Pentonville prison about with him on wheels, I am far from denying that there was a real element of cruelty in the Middle Ages, but the point here is that it was concerned with one side of life, which is cruel at the best, and that this involved more cruelty for the same reason that it involved more courage. When we think of our ancestors as the men who inflicted tortures, we ought sometimes to think of them as the men who defied them. But the modern critic of medievalism commonly looks only at these crooked shadows and not at the common daylight of the Middle Ages. When he has got over this indignant astonishment at the fact that fighters fought and that hangmen hanged, he assumes that any other ideas there may have been were ineffectual and fruitless. He despises the monk for avoiding the very same activities which he despises the warrior for cultivating. And he insists that the arts of war were sterile, without even admitting the possibility that the arts of peace were productive. But the truth is that it is precisely in the arts of peace and in the type of production that the Middle Ages stand singularly and unique. This is not eulogy, but history. An informed man must recognise this productive peculiarity even if he happens to hate it. The melodramatic things currently called medieval are much older and more universal, such as the sport of tournament or the use of torture. The tournament was indeed a Christian and liberal advance on the gladiatorial show since the lords risked themselves and not merely their slaves. Torture, so far from being peculiarly medieval, was copied from pagan Rome and its most rationalist political science and its application to others besides slaves was really part of the slow medieval extinction of slavery. Torture, indeed, is a logical thing common in states innocent of fanaticism, as in the great agnostic empire of China. What was really arresting and remarkable about the Middle Ages, as the Spartan discipline was peculiar to Sparta, or the Russian communes typical of Russia, was precisely its positive social scheme of production, of the making, building and growing of all good things of life. For the tale told in a book like this cannot really touch on medieval England at all. The dynasties and the parliaments passed like a changing cloud and across a stable and fruitful landscape. 
The institutions which affected the masses can be compared to corn or fruit trees in one practical sense, at least, that they grew upwards from below. There may have been better societies, and assuredly we have not to look far for worse. But it is doubtful if there was ever so spontaneous a society. We cannot do justice, for instance, to the local government of that epoch, even where it was very faulty and fragmentary, by any comparisons with the plans of local government laid down today. Modern local government always comes from above, It is, at best, granted. It is more often merely imposed. The modern English oligarchy, the modern German Empire, are necessarily more efficient in making municipalities upon a plan, or rather a pattern. The medievals not only had self-government, but their self-government was self-made. They did indeed, as the central powers of the national monarchies grew stronger, seek and procure the stamp of state approval, but it was approval of a popular fact already in existence. Men banded together in guilds and parishes long before local government acts were dreamed of. Like charity, which was worked in the same way, their home rule began at home. The reactions of recent centuries have left most educated men bankrupt of the corporate imagination required even to imagine this. They only think of a mob as a thing that breaks things, even if they admit it is right to break them. But the mob made these things. An artist mocked as many-headed, an artist with many eyes and hands, created these masterpieces. And if the modern sceptic, in his detestation of the democratic ideal, complains of my calling them masterpieces, a simple answer will for the moment serve. It is enough to reply that the very word masterpiece is borrowed from the terminology of the medieval craftsmen. But such points in the guild system can be considered a little later. Here we are only concerned with the quite spontaneous springing upwards of all these social institutions such as they were. They rose in the streets like a silent rebellion, like a still and statuesque riot. In modern constitutional countries there are practically no political institutions thus given by the people. All are received by the people. There is only one thing that stands in our midst, attenuated and threatened, but enthroned in some power like a ghost of the Middle Ages, the trades unions. In agriculture, what happened to the land was like a universal landslide, but by a prodigy beyond the catastrophes of geology, it may be said that the land had slid uphill. Rural civilization was on a wholly new and much higher level. Yet there was no great social convulsions or, apparently, even great social campaigns to explain it. It is possibly a solitary instance in history of men thus falling upwards, at least of outcasts falling on their feet or vagrants straying into the promised land. Such a thing could not be and was not a mere accident. Yet, if we go by conscious political plans, it was something like a miracle. There had appeared, like a subterranean race cast upon the sun, something unknown to the august civilization of the Roman Empire, a peasantry. At the beginning of the Dark Ages, the great pagan cosmopolitan society, now grown Christian, was as much a slave state as old South Carolina. By the 14th century, it was almost as much a state of peasant proprietors as modern France. No laws had been passed against slavery, no dogmas even had condemned it by definition, no war had been waged against it, no new race or ruling caste had repudiated it, but it was gone. This startling and silent transformation is perhaps the best measure of the pressure of popular life in the Middle Ages, of how fast it was making new things in its spiritual factory,
like everything else in the medieval revolution, from its cathedrals to its ballads, it was as anonymous as it was enormous. It is admitted that the conscience and active emancipators everywhere were the parish priests and the religious brotherhoods, but no name among them has survived and no man of them has reaped his reward in this world. Countless Clarksons and innumerable Wilberforces without political machinery or public fame worked at deathbeds and confessionals in all the villages of Europe, and the vast system of slavery vanished. It was probably the widest work ever done which was voluntary on both sides, and the Middle Ages was in this and other things the age of volunteers. It is possible enough to state roughly the stages through which the thing passed, but such a statement does not explain the loosening of the grip of the great slave owners, and it cannot be explained except psychologically. The Catholic type of Christianity was not merely an element, it was a climate, and in that climate the slave would not grow. I have already suggested, touching the transformation of the Roman Empire, which was the background of all these centuries, how a mystical view of man's dignity must have this effect. A table that walked and talked, or a stool that flew with wings out of window, would be about as workable a thing as an immortal chattel. But though here, as everywhere, the spirit explains the processes, and the processes cannot even plausibly explain the spirit, these processes involve two very practical points, without which we cannot understand how this great popular civilization was created or how it was destroyed. What we call the manners were originally the villi of the pagan lords, each with its population of slaves. Under this process, however it be explained, what had occurred was the diminishment of the Lord's claim to the whole profit of a slave estate, by which it became a claim to the profit of part of it, and dwindled at last to certain dues or customary payments to the Lord, having paid which the slave could enjoy not only the use of the land, but the profit of it. It must be remembered that over a great part, and especially very important parts, of the whole territory, the lords were abbots, magistrates elected by a mystical communism, and themselves often of peasant birth. Men not only obtained a fair amount of justice under their care, but a fair amount of freedom even from their carelessness. But two details of the development are very vital. First, as has been hinted elsewhere, the slave was long in the intermediate status of a serf. This meant that while the land was entitled to the services of the man, he was equally entitled to the support of the land. He could not be evicted. He could not even, in the modern fashion, have his rent raised. At the beginning, it was merely that the slave was owned, but at least he could not be disowned. At the end, he had really become a small landlord, merely because it was not the lord that owned him, but the land. It is hardly unsafe to suggest that in this, by one of the paradoxes of this extraordinary period, the very fixity of serfdom was a surface to freedom. The new peasant inherited something of the stability of the slave, he did not come to life in a competitive scramble where everybody was trying to snatch his freedom from him. He found himself among neighbours who already regarded his presence as normal and his frontiers as natural frontiers, and among whom all powerful customs crushed all experiments in competition. By a trick or overturn, no romancer has dared to put in a tale this prisoner had become the governor of his own prison. For a little time it was almost true that an Englishman's house was his castle, because it had been built strong enough to be his dungeon. The other notable element was this, that when the produce of the land began by custom to be cut up and only partially transmitted to the lord, 
the remainder was generally subdivided into two types of property. One the serfs enjoyed severally in private patches, while the other they enjoyed in common and generally in common with the lord. Thus arose the momentously important medieval institutions of the common land, owned side by side with private land. It was an alternative and a refuge. The medievals, except when they were monks, were none of them communists, but they were all, as it were, potential communists. It is typical of the dark and dehumanized picture now drawn of the period that our romances constantly describe a broken man as falling back on the forests and the outlaw's den, but never describe him as falling back on the common land, which was a much more common incident. Medievalism believed in mending its broken men, and as the idea existed in the communal life for monks, it existed in the communal land for peasants. It was their great green hospital, their free and airy workhouse. A common was not a naked and negative thing like the scrub or heath we call a common on the edges of the suburbs. It was a reserve of wealth, like a reserve of grain in a barn. It was deliberately kept back as a balance, as we talk of a balance at the bank. Now these provisions for a healthier distribution of property would by themselves show any man of imagination that a real moral effort had been made towards social justice, that it could not have been mere evolutionary accident that slowly turned the slave into a serf, and the serf into a peasant proprietor. But if anybody still thinks that mere blind luck without any groping for the light, had somehow brought about the peasant condition in place of the agrarian slave estate, he has only to turn to what was happening in all the other callings and affairs of humanity. Then he will cease to doubt, for he will find the same medieval men busy upon a social scheme which points as plainly in effect to pity and a craving for equality and it is a system which could no more be produced by accident than one of their cathedrals could be built by an earthquake. Most work beyond the primary work of agriculture was guarded by the egalitarian vigilance of the guilds. It is hard to find any term to measure the distance between this system and modern society. One can only approach it first by the faint traces it has left. Our daily life is littered with the debris of the Middle Ages, especially of dead words which no longer carry their meaning. I have already suggested one example. We hardly call up the picture of a return to Christian communism whenever we mention Wimbledon Common. The truth descends to such trifles as the titles which we write on letters and postcards. The puzzling and truncated monosyllable Esquire is a pathetic relic of a remote evolution from chivalry to snobbery. No two historic things could well be more different than an esquire and a squire. The first was, above all things, an incomplete and probationary position, the tadpole of knighthood. The second is, above all things, a complete and assured position, the status of the owners and rulers of rural England throughout recent centuries. Our esquires did not win their estates till they had given up any particular fancy for winning their spurs. Esquire does not mean squire, and ESQ, full stop, does not mean anything. But it remains on our letters a little wriggle in pen and ink and an indecipherable hieroglyph twisted by the strange turns of our history, which have turned a military discipline into a Pacific oligarchy, and that into a mere plutocracy at last. And there are similar historic riddles to be unpicked in the similar forms of social address. There is something singularly forlorn about the modern word Mr., Even in sound it has a simpering feebleness which marks the shriveling of the strong word from which it came. 
nor, indeed, is the symbol of the mere sound inaccurate. I remember seeing a German story of Samson in which he bore the unassuming name of Simpson, which surely shows Samson very much shorn. There is something of the same dismal duminiuendo in the evolution of a master into a mister. The very vital importance of the word master is this. A guild was, very broadly speaking, a trade union in which every man was his own employer. That is, a man could not work at any trade unless he would join the league and accept the laws of that trade. But he worked in his own shop with his own tools and the whole profit went to himself. But the word employer marks a modern deficiency which makes the modern use of the word master quite inexact. A master meant something quite other and greater than a boss. It meant a master of the work, where it now means only a master of the workmen. It is an elementary character of capitalism that a ship owner need not know the right end of a ship or a landowner have even seen the landscape, that the owner of a gold mine may be interested in nothing but old pewter, or the owner of a railway travel exclusively in balloons. He may be a more successful capitalist if he has a hobby of his own business. He is often a more successful capitalist if he has the sense to leave it to a manager but economically he can control the business because he is a capitalist, not because he has any kind of hobby or any kind of sense. The highest grade in the guild system was a master, and it meant a mastery of the business. To take the term created by the colleges in the same epoch, all the medieval bosses were masters of arts. The other grades were the journeyman and the apprentice, but like the corresponding degrees at the universities, they were grades through which every common man could pass. They were not social classes. They were degrees and not castes. This is the whole point of the recurrent romance about the apprentice marrying his master's daughter. The master would not be surprised at such a thing any more than an M.A. would swell with aristocratic indignation when his daughter married a B.A. When we pass from the strictly educational hierarchy to the strictly egalitarian ideal, we find again that the remains of the thing today are so distorted and disconnected as to be comic. There are city companies which inherit the coats of arms and the immense relative wealth of the old guilds and inherit nothing else. Even what is good about them is not what was good about the guilds. In one case, we shall find something like a worshipful company of bricklayers in which, it is unnecessary to say, there is not a single bricklayer or anybody who has ever known a bricklayer but in which the senior partners of a few big businesses in the city, with a few faded military men with a taste in cookery, tell each other in after-dinner speeches that it has been the glory of their lives to make allegorical bricks without straw. In another case we shall find a worshipful company of whitewashers who do deserve their name, in the sense that many of them employ a large number of other people to whitewash. These companies support large charities and often doubtless very valuable charities, but their object is quite different from that of the old charities of the guilds. The aim of the guild charities was the same as the aim of the common land. It was to resist inequality. Or, as some earnest old gentleman of the last generation would probably put it, to resist evolution. It was to ensure not only that bricklaying should survive and succeed, but that every bricklayer should survive and succeed. It sought to rebuild the ruins of any bricklayer and to give any faded whitewasher a new white coat. It was the whole aim of the guilds to cobble their cobblers like their shoes and clout their clothiers with their clothes. 
to strengthen the weakest link, or go after the hundredth sheep, in short, to keep the row of little shops unbroken like a line of battle. It resisted the growth of a big shop like the growth of a dragon. Now, even the whitewashers of the whitewashers' company will not pretend that it exists to prevent a small shop from being swallowed by a big shop, or that it has done anything whatever to prevent it. At the best, the kindness it would show to a bankrupt whitewasher would be a kind of compensation. It would not be reinstatement. It would not be the restoration of status in an industrial system. So careful of the type, it seems, so careless of the single life, and by that very modern evolutionary philosophy, the type itself has been destroyed. The old guilds, with the same objects of equality, of course, insisted prematurely upon the same level system of payment and treatment, which is a point of complaint against the modern trade unions. But they insisted also, as the trade unions cannot do, upon a high standard of craftsmanship, which still astonishes the world in the corners of perishing buildings or the colours of broken glass. There is no artist or art critic who will not concede, however distant his own style from the Gothic school, that there was in this time a nameless but universal artistic touch in the moulding of the very tools of life. Accident has preserved the rudest sticks and stools and pots and pans which have suggestive shapes as if they were possessed not by devils but by elves. For they were, indeed, as compared with subsequent systems, produced in the incredible fairyland of a free country. That the most medieval of modern institutions the trades unions, do not fight for the same ideal of ascetic finish is true and certainly tragic. But to make it a matter of blame is wholly to misunderstand the tragedy. The trades unions are confederations of men without property, seeking to balance its absence by numbers and the necessary character of their labour. The guilds are confederations of men with property, seeking to ensure each man in the possession of that property. This is, of course, the only condition of affairs in which property can properly be said to exist at all. We should not speak of a Negro community in which most men were white, but the rare Negroes were giants. We should not conceive a married community in which most men were bachelors and three men had harems. A married community means a community where most people are married, not a community where one or two people are very much married. A propertyed community means a community where most people have property, not a community where there are a few capitalists. But in fact, the guildsmen, as also, for that matter, the serfs, semi-serfs and peasants, were much richer than can be realised even from the fact that the guilds protected the possessions of houses, tools and just payment. The surplus is self-evident upon any just study of the prices of the period, when all deductions have been made, of course, for the different value of the actual coinage. When a man could get a goose or a gallon of ale for one or two of the smallest and commonest coins, the matter is in no way affected by the name of those coins. Even where the individual wealth was severely limited, the collective wealth was very large. The wealth of the guilds, of the parishes, and especially of the monastic estates. It is important to remember this fact in the subsequent history of England. The next fact to note is the local government grew out of things like the guild system, and not the system from the government. In sketching the sound principles of this lost society, I shall not, of course, be supposed by any sane person to be describing a moral paradise, or to be implying that it was free from the faults and fights and sorrows that harass human life in all times and certainly not least in our own time. 
There was a fair amount of rioting and fighting in connection with the guilds, and there was especially, for some time, a combative rivalry between the guilds of merchants who sold things and those of craftsmen who made them, a conflict in which the craftsmen on the whole prevailed. But whichever party may have been predominant, it was the heads of the guild who became the heads of the town, and not vice versa. The stiff survivals of this once very spontaneous uprising can again be seen in the now anomalous constitution of the Lord Mayor and the livery of the City of London. We are told so monotonously that the government of our fathers reposed upon arms, that it is valid to insist that this, their most intimate and everyday sort of government, was wholly based upon tools a government in which the workman's tool became the sceptre. Blake, in one of his symbolic fantasies, suggests that in the golden age, the gold and gems should be taken from the hilt of the sword and put upon the handle of the plough. But something very like this did happen in the interlude of this medieval democracy, fermenting under the crust of medieval monarchy and aristocracy, where productive implements often took on the pomp of heraldry. The guilds often exhibited emblems and pageantry so compact of their most prosaic uses that we can only parallel them by imagining armorial tabards or even religious vestments, woven out of a navvy's corduroys or a coster's pearl buttons. Two more points must be briefly added and the rough sketch of this now foreign and even fantastic state will be as complete as it can be made here. Both refer to the links between this popular life and the politics which are conventionally the whole of history. The first, and for that age the most evident, is the Charter. To recur once more to the parallel of trades unions... As convenient for the casual reader of today, the charter of a guild roughly corresponds to that recognition for which the railway men and other trades unionists asked some years ago without success. By this they had the authority of the king, the central or national government, and this was of great moral weight with medievals who always conceived of freedom as a positive status, not as a negative escape. They had none of the modern romanticism which makes liberty akin to loneliness. Their view remains in the phase about giving a man the freedom of a city. They had no desire to give him the freedom of a wilderness. To say that they had also the authority of the church is something of an understatement for religion ran like a rich thread through the rude tapestry of these popular things while they were still merely popular, and many a trade society must have had a patron saint long before it had a royal seal. The other point is that it was from these municipal groups already in existence that the first men were chosen for the largest and perhaps the last of the great medieval experiments, the Parliament. We have all read at school that Simon de Montfort and Edward I, when they first summoned commons to council, chiefly as advisers on local taxation, called two burgesses from every town. If we had read a little more closely, those simple words would have given away the whole secret of the lost medieval civilization. We had only to ask what burgesses were and whether they grew on trees we should immediately have discovered that England was full of little parliaments, out of which the great parliament was made. And if it be a matter of wonder that the great council, still called in quaint archism by its old title of the House of Commons, is the only one of these popular or elective corporations of which we hear much in our books of history, the explanation, I fear, is simple and a little sad. It is that the Parliament was the one among these medieval creations which ultimately consented to betray and to destroy the rest.
Nine. Nationality and the French Wars. If anyone wishes to know what we mean when we say that Christendom was and is one culture or one civilization, there is a rough but plain way of putting it. It is by asking what is the most common, or rather the most commonplace, of all the uses of the word Christian. There is, of course, the highest use of all, but it has nowadays many other uses. Sometimes a Christian means an evangelical. Sometimes, and more recently, a Christian means a Quaker. Sometimes a Christian means a modest person who believes that he bears a resemblance to Christ. But it has long had one meaning in casual speech among common people, and it means a culture or a civilization. Ben Gunn on Treasure Island did not actually say to Jim Hawkins, "I feel myself out of touch with a certain type of civilization," but he did say, "I haven't tasted Christian food." The old wives in a village, looking at a lady with short hair and trousers, do not indeed say, "We perceive the divergence between her culture and our own," but they do say, "Why can't she dress like a Christian?" That the sentiment has thus soaked down into the simplest and even stupidest daily talk is but one evidence that Christendom was a very real thing. But it was also, as we have seen, a very localized thing, especially in the Middle Ages, and that very lively localism, the Christian faith and affections encouraged, led at least to an excessive and exclusive parochialism. There were rival shrines at the same saint, and a sort of duel between two statues of the same divinity. By a process, it is now our difficult duty to follow. A real estrangement between European peoples began. Men began to feel that foreigners did not eat or drink like Christians, and even when the philosophic schism came, to doubt if they were Christians. There was indeed much more than this involved. While the internal structure of medievalism was thus parochial and largely popular in the greater affairs, and especially the external affairs such as peace and war, most, though by no means all, of what was medieval was monarchical. To see what the kings came to mean, we must glance back at the great background, as of darkness and daybreak, against which the first figures of our history have already appeared. That background was the war with the barbarians. While it lasted, Christendom was not only one nation, but more like one city and a besieged city. Wessex was but one wall, or Paris, one tower of it. And in one tongue and spirit, Bede might have chronicled the siege of Paris, or Abbo sung the song of Alfred. What followed was a conquest and a conversation. All the end of the Dark Ages and the dawn of medievalism is full of the evangelizing of barbarism, and it is the paradox of the Crusades that though the Saracen was superficially more civilized than the Christian. It was a sound instinct which saw him also to be in spirit a destroyer. In the simpler case of northern heathenry, the civilization spread with a simpler progress. But it was not till the end of the Middle Ages and close on the Reformation that the people of Prussia, the wild land lying beyond Germany, were baptized at all. A flippant person. If he permitted himself a profane confusion with vaccination, might almost be inclined to suggest that for some reason it didn't take even then. The barbarian peril was thus brought under bit by bit, and even in the case of Islam, the alien power which could not be crushed was evidently curbed. The Crusades became hopeless, but they also became needless. As these fears faded, the princes of Europe, who had come together to face them, were left facing each other. They had more leisure to find that their own captaincies clashed, but this would easily have been overruled, or would have produced a petty riot, had not the true creative spontaneity 
of which we have spoken in the local life, tended to real variety. Royalties found they were representatives almost without knowing it, and many a king insisting on a genealogical tree or a title deed found he spoke for the forests and the songs of a whole countryside. In England, especially the transition is typified in the accident which raised to the throne one of the noblest men of the Middle Ages. Edward I came clad in all the splendours of his epoch. He had taken the cross and fought the Saracens. He had been the only worthy foe of Simon de Montfort in those baronial wars which, as we have seen, were the first sign, however faint, of a serious theory that England should be ruled by its barons rather than its kings. He proceeded, like Simon de Montfort, and more solidly to develop the great medieval institution of a parliament. As has been said, it was superimposed on the existing parish democracies and was first merely the summoning of local representatives to advise on local taxation. Indeed, its rise was one with the rise of what we now call taxation, and there is thus a thread of theory leading to its later claims to have the sole right of taxing. But in the beginning, it was an instrument of the most equitable kings, and notably an instrument of Edward I. He often quarrelled with his parliaments and may sometimes have displeased his people, which has never been at all the same thing, but on the whole he was supremely the representative sovereign. In this connection, one curious and difficult question may be considered here, though it marks the end of a story that began with the Norman conquests. It is pretty certain that he was never more truly a representative king, one might say a republican king, than in the fact that he expelled the Jews. The problem is so much misunderstood and mixed with notions of a stupid spite against a gifted and historic race as such, that we must pause for a paragraph upon it. The Jews in the Middle Ages were as powerful as they were unpopular. They were the capitalists of the age, the men with wealth banked ready for use. It is very tenable that in this way they were useful. It is certain that in this way they were used... It is also quite fair to say that in this way they were ill-used. The ill-usage was not indeed that suggested at random in romances, which mostly revolve on the one idea that their teeth were pulled out. Those who know this as a story about King John generally do not know the rather important fact that it was a story against King John. It is probably doubtful, it was only insisted on as exceptional, and it was, by that very insistence, obviously regarded as disreputable. But the real unfairness of the Jews' position was deeper and more distressing to a sensitive and highly civilised people. They might reasonably say that Christian kings and nobles, and even Christian popes and bishops, used for Christian purposes such as the Crusades and the cathedrals, the money that could only be accumulated in such mountains by a usury they inconsistently denounced as unchristian, and then, when worse times came, gave up the Jew to the fury of the poor whom that useful usury had ruined. That was the real case for the Jew, and no doubt he really felt himself oppressed. Unfortunately, it was the case for the Christians that they, with at least equal reason, felt him as the oppressor, and that mutual charge of tyranny is the Semitic trouble in all times. It is certain that in popular sentiment this anti-Semitism was not excused as uncharitableness, but simply regarded as charity. Chaucer put his curse on Hebrew cruelty into the mouth of the soft-hearted prioress, who wept when she saw a mouse in a trap, and it was when Edward, breaking the rule by which the rulers had hitherto fostered their banker's wealth, flung the alien financiers out of the land, that his people probably saw him most plainly at once as a knight-errant and a tender father of his people.
Whatever the merits of this question, such a portrait of Edward was far from false. He was the most just and conscientious type of medieval monarch, and it is exactly this fact that brings into relief the new force which was to cross his path and in strife with which he died. While he was just, he was also eminently legal, and it must be remembered, if we would not merely read back ourselves into the past, that much of the dispute of the time was legal. The adjustment of dynastic and feudal differences not yet felt to be anything else. In this spirit, Edward was asked to arbitrate by the rival claimants to the Scottish crown, and in this sense he seems to have arbitrated quite honestly. But his legal, or as some would say, pedantic mind, made the proviso that the Scottish king, as such, was already under his suzerainty, and he probably never understood the spirit he called up against him, for that spirit has yet no name. We call it today nationalism. Scotland resisted, and the adventures of an outlawed knight named Wallace soon furnished it with one of those legends which are more important than history. In a way, that was then at least equally practical. The Catholic priests of Scotland became especially the patriotic and anti-English party, as indeed they remained even throughout the Reformation. Wallace was defeated and executed, but the heather was already on fire, and the espousal of the new national cause by one of Edward's own knights named Bruce seemed to the old king a mere betrayal of feudal equity. He died in a final fury at the head of a new invasion upon the very border of Scotland. With his last words, the great king commanded that his bones should be borne in front of the battle, and the bones, which were of gigantic size, were eventually buried with the epitaph here lies Edward the Tall, who was the hammer of the Scots. It was a true epitaph, but in a sense exactly opposite to its intention. He was their hammer, but he did not break but make them, for he smote them on an anvil and he forged them into a sword. That coincidence or cause of events, which must often be remarked in this story, by which, for whatever reason, our most powerful kings did not somehow leave their power secure, showed itself in the next reign, when the baronial quarrels were resumed and the northern kingdom, under Bruce, cut itself finally free by the stroke of Bannockburn. Otherwise, the reign is a mere interlude, and it is with the succeeding one that we find the new national tendency yet further developed. The great French wars, in which England won so much glory, were opened by Edward III, and grew more and more nationalist. But even to feel the transition of the time, we must first realise that the third Edward made as strictly legal and dynastic a claim to France as the first Edward had made to Scotland. The claim was far weaker in substance, but it was equally conventional in form. He thought, or said, he had a claim on a kingdom as a squire might say he had a claim on an estate. Superficially, it was an affair for the English and French lawyers. To read into this that the people were sheep, bought and sold is to misunderstand all medieval history. Sheep have no trade union. The English arms owed much of their force to the class of the free yeomen, and the success of the infantry especially of the archery, largely stood for that popular element which had already unhorsed the high French chivalry at Courtrai. But the point is this, that while the lawyers were talking about the Salic law, the soldiers, who would once have been talking about guild law or glebe law, were already talking about English law and French law. The French were the first in this tendency to see something outside the township the trade brotherhood, the feudal Jews, or the village common. The whole history of the change can be seen in the fact that the French had early begun to call the nation the greater land. France was the first of the nations and has remained the norm of nations, 
the only one which is a nation and nothing else. But in the collision the English grew equally corporate, and a true patriotic applause probably hailed the victories of Cressy and Poitiers, as it certainly hailed the later victory of Agincourt. The latter did not indeed occur until after an interval of international revolutions in England, which will be considered on a later page. But as regards the growth of nationalism, the French wars were continuous, and the English tradition that followed after Agincourt was continuous also. It is embodied in rude and spirited ballads before the great Elizabethans. The Henry V of Shakespeare is not indeed the Henry V of history, yet he is more historic. He is not only a saner and more genial, but a more important person. For the tradition of the whole adventure was not that of Henry, but of the populace who turned Henry into Harry. There were a thousand Harrys in the army at Agincourt, and not one. For the figure that Shakespeare framed out of the legends of the great victory is largely the figure that all men saw as the Englishman of the Middle Ages. He did not really talk in poetry, like Shakespeare's hero, but he would have liked to. Not being able to do so, he sang, and the English people principally appear in contemporary impressions as the singing people. They were evidently not only expansive, but exaggerative, and perhaps it was not only in battle that they drew the long bow. That fine farcical imagery, which has descended to the comic songs and common speech of the English poor, even today, had its happy infancy when England thus became a nation, though the modern poor, under the pressure of economic progress, have partly lost the gaiety and kept only the humour. But in that early April of patriotism, the new unity of the state still sat lightly upon them, and a cobbler in Henry's army, who would at home have thought first that it was the day of St. Crispin of the cobblers, might truly as well as sincerely have hailed the splintering of the French lances in a storm of arrows, and cried, St. George for Merry England! Human things are uncomfortably complex, and while it was the April of patriotism, it was the autumn of medieval society. In the next chapter, I shall try to trace the forces that were disintegrating the civilization. And even here, after the first victories, it is necessary to insist on the bitterness and barren ambition that showed itself more and more in the later stages as the long French wars dragged on. France was at the time far less happy than England, wasted by the treason of its nobles and the weakness of its kings almost as much as by the invasion of the islanders. And yet it was this very despair and humiliation that seemed at last to rend the sky, and let in the light of what it is hard for the coldest historian to call anything but a miracle. It may be this apparent miracle that has apparently made nationalism eternal. It may be conjectured, though the question is too difficult to be developed here, that there was something in the great moral change which turned the Roman Empire into Christendom, by which each great thing to which it afterwards gave birth was baptised into a promise, or at least into a hope of permanence. It may be that each of its ideas was, as it were, mixed with immortality. Certainly something of this kind can be seen in the conception which turned marriage from a contract into a sacrament, but whatever the cause, it is certain that even for the most secular types of our own time, their relation to their native land has become not contractual, but sacramental. We may say that flags are rags, that frontiers are fictions, but the very men who have said it for half their lives are dying for a rag, and being rent in pieces for a fiction, even as I write." When the battle trumpet blew in 1914, modern humanity had grouped itself into nations almost before it knew what it had done. 
It's the same sound is heard a thousand years hence. There is no sign in the world to suggest to any rational man that humanity will not do exactly the same thing. But even if this great and strange development be not enduring, the point is that it is felt as enduring. It is hard to give a definition of loyalty, but perhaps we come near it if we call it the thing which operates where an obligation is felt to be unlimited. And the minimum of duty, or even decency, asked of a patriot, is the maximum that is asked by the most miraculous view of marriage. The recognised reality of patriotism is not mere citizenship. The recognised reality of patriotism is for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, in national growth and glory, and in national disgrace and decline. It is not to travel in the ship of state as a passenger, but if need be to go down with the ship. It is needless to tell here again the tale of that earthquake episode in which a clearance in the earth and sky above the confusion and abasement of the crowns, showed the commanding figure of a woman of the people. She was, in her own living loneliness, a French revolution. She was the proof that a certain power was not in the French kings or in the French knights, but in the French. But the fact that she saw something above her that was other than the sky, the fact that she lived the life of a saint and died the death of a martyr, probably stamped the new national sentiment with a sacred seal. And the fact that she fought for a defeated country, and, even though it was victorious, was herself ultimately defeated, defines that darker element of devotion of which I spoke above, which makes even pessimism consistent with patronism. It is more appropriate in this place to consider the ultimate reaction of this sacrifice upon the romance and the realities of England. I have never counted it a patriotic part to plaster my own country with conventional and unconvincing compliments. But no one can understand England who does not understand that such an episode as this, in which she was so clearly in the wrong has yet been ultimately linked up with a curious quality in which she is rather unusually in the right. No one candidly comparing us with other countries can say we have specially failed to build the sepulchres of the prophets we stoned, or even the prophets who stoned us. The English historical tradition has at least a loose large-mindedness which always finally falls into the praise not only of great foreigners but great foes. Often, along with much injustice, it has an illogical generosity, and while it will dismiss a great people with more ignorance, it treats a great personality with hearty hero-worship. There are more examples than one even in this chapter, for our books may well make out Wallace a better man than he was, as they afterwards assigned to Washington an even better cause than he had. Thackeray smiled at Miss Jane Porter's picture of Wallace going into war weeping with a cambric pocket handkerchief, but her attitude was more English and not less accurate for her idealization was, if anything, nearer the truth than Thackeray's own notion of medievalism, of hypocritical hogs in armour. Edward, who figures as a tyrant, could weep with compassion, and it is probable enough that Wallace wept, with or without a pocket handkerchief. Moreover, her romance was a reality, the reality of nationalism and she knew much more about the Scottish Patriots' ages before her time than Thackeray did about the Irish Patriots immediately under his nose. Thackeray was a great man, but in that matter he was a very small man, and indeed an invisible one. The cases of Wallace and Washington and many others are here only mentioned, however, to suggest an eccentric magnanimity which surely balances some of our prejudices. We have done many foolish things, but we have at least done one fine thing. We have whitewashed our worst enemies. 
If we have done this for a bold Scottish raider and a vigorous Virginian slaveholder, it may at least show that we are not likely to fail in our final appreciation of the one white figure in the motley processions of war. I believe there to be, in modern England, something like a universal enthusiasm on this subject. We have seen a great English critic write a book about this heroine in opposition to a great French critic, solely in order to blame him for not having praised her enough. And I do not believe there lives an Englishman now who, if he had the offer of being an Englishman then, would not discard his chance of riding as the crowned conqueror at the head of all the spears of Agincourt, if he could be that English common soldier of whom tradition tells that he broke his spear asunder to bind it into a cross for Joan of Arc. Ten, The War of the Usurpers The poet Pope, though a friend of the greatest of Tory Democrats, Bolingbroke, necessarily lived in a world in which even Toryism was Whiggish, and the Whig, as a wit, never expressed his political point more clearly than in Pope's line which ran, The right divine of kings to govern wrong. It will be apparent when I deal with that period that I do not palliate the real unreason in divine right as Filmer and some of the pedantic cavaliers construed it. They profess the impossible ideal of non-resistance to any national and legitimate power, though I cannot see that even that was so servile and superstitious as the more modern ideal of non-resistance even to a foreign and lawless power. But the seventeenth century was an age of sects, that is, of fads, and the Filmerites made a fad of divine right. Its roots were older, equally religious, but much more realistic, and though tangled with many other and even opposite things of the Middle Ages, ramify through all the changes we have now to consider. The connection can hardly be stated better than by taking Pope's easy epigram and pointing out that it is, after all, very weak in philosophy. The right divine of kings to govern wrong, considered as a sneer, really evades all that we mean by a right. To have a right to do a thing is not at all the same as to be right in doing it. What Pope says satirically about a divine right is what we all say quite seriously about a human right. If a man has a right to vote, 